<laughs> hello, hello, hello. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I know this is um hmm. This is gonna be uh I hate to say um this is very intriguing. The um the whole case. This is Sarah Teague, uh Heather Teague's mom. Sarah, say hi. Hey. <laughs> So I've been talking about Heather and I'm going to have to put my phone away because people are blowing my phone up. Okay. So, so I've been speaking on Heather. Heather is an unsolved case. Heather disappeared August 26th of 1995. An eyewitness stated that he saw um, a man drag Heather off Newport Beach at gunpoint. He dragged her into the woods. I'm sorry. And I, 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 I'm sorry, Sarah. You and I have talked about this so much. It's just that. Um, I know it's very emotional. It's it's hard. It's hard to comprehend what, so, what, you, do, what you do know. I, I know it. I know it's really hard to even. Yeah. At the time, Heather was 23 years old. Now, the eyewitness happened to be looking through a telescope. And from what was reported across the Ohio River, he said he witnessed that abduction. He said that the man um, had her at gunpoint. He had on no shirt and blue jeans. At the time of the, of the disappearance, let me know if this is a true statement or not. The police were using search dogs. They had helicopters and they were combing the area looking for Heather. They found her bathing suit and other things that suggested that a crime had been committed, but they never, ever found Heather. The guy was described as six feet tall, weighing about 200 uh, to 230 pounds. Mm -hmm. uh, he had brown hair and a Dark bushy, bushy, bushy beard. Is right. that correct? That's right. Okay. Now, there was, I'm going to say, uh, a rush to judgment. Uh, okay. Can I say that? No. That it was a rush? Well, it, it took him four days to do a composite sketch. Okay. And only after a film of a Bronco was turned into the state police, did they have a suspect. So you were showing me the poster that you had, and I do have the pictures as well. Um, so the person of interest turned out to be Marvin. They called him Marty Deal. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason is because months before then, in February, he was accused of, should I say, aring a woman? I don't know what you're talking about. Oh, that's what they're saying. The reason why Marty came, when I'm reading through your stuff, I read this. They said Marty was supposedly um, in February of 1995, he was supposedly accused of aring someone. And then when they got the picture of the red Bronco, that's what led them to Marty. Because he was in the red Bronco at the time that, uh, that abduction and aura was supposed to have happened. Is that not how you remember it? I don't know what you're talking about. February. Uh... No, Marty was accused of doing something in February. Marty Deal was accused of doing something in February, which doesn't make sense because he was just released from jail six weeks before I, I, your daughter was abducted. Correct? Yeah, I, I don't know what you, I don't know what you. Yep. So that's what they were saying. I was telling you, these articles are all over the place. Right. That's why I'm glad I have your file. Yeah, Marty, Marty would have never been a suspect had the film of the Bronco not been turned into state police on, on day four, uh, July the 20th. Well, I mean. Okay. So Marty was released six weeks before Heather disappeared. Correct. Right. 
Okay. Can you show us the picture of the... Okay. On day four, August the 30th, this, this is the sketch. This is his driver's license. And then that's the sketch. You can see... You can see the face is absolutely identical to Marty Dill's 94 driver's license. Down to an underbite. If you look real closely, you can even tell the artist drew the underbite, the bushy hair. and yeah. Okay. This is how Marty Dill looked on July the 15th of 1995, the day he got out of jail. He, was, he did not have a pot belly. He was totally bald. And then the picture on the left is of Christopher Bilo, which the entire sketch would have been Christopher Bilo had the state police not used Marty Dill's 94 driver's license as the sketch. But as you can see in the picture, Marty Dill was bald. He had to have all of his hair and his beard cut and shaved to be custodian at the jail. So again, they were lying. And now I do have that invoice that you sent to me to show when that was commissioned. Is that, so hold on, let me get this so I can show them exactly what you sent to me okay. because that sketch was commissioned in 1994. Right. Marty okay. Dill was the only suspect in a rape in July of 94, the uh, purchase order that you're about to show. Okay. Here is the purchase order that, let me go back to the top. Oh, well, that's the picture of Marty. Right. But the purchase order is right here. Okay. This is the purchase order. Um, and this is when they commissioned that sketch it was commissioned on July 14th, 1994. This is when that purchase order was done. This is the sketch that, that Sarah was just showing you. Now, Sarah pulled all of these records herself. She requested uh, the information through the Freedom of Information Act. She pulled these foyers. She was doing her own legwork Every time she went to prove to them that this couldn't have been Marvin Deal at the time of uh, Heather's disappearance, Marty didn't have any facial hair. Marty didn't. Uh, Marvin didn't have any hair on his head. She also sent me a letter from someone that worked at the detention center. Okay, let me stop sharing this. I have a letter that she sent that was sent by someone who worked at the detention center stating for a fact that he did not have any hair at all. So the, one, the young woman's name is Beverly Jones. She says, my name is Beverly J. Jones. I work for the Webster County Detention Center, 911 Department, Dixon, Kentucky. Part-time as a 911 operator, uh, also hairdresser, and I would occasionally do haircuts for the jailer and the inmates to help out. Prior to working at the detention center, I worked for an attorney in Henderson that represented Marvin Marty Deal in a non-criminal matter. And I remember thinking how pretty his hair was. The next time I came in contact with Marvin Deal, I was then at work at the Webster County Detention Center and saw him and all of his beautiful hair, uh, all of his beautiful head of hair uh, was gone. I couldn't believe what a difference it made in his appearance. I even confirmed with the deputy that it was Marty Deal. I believe he was a trustee doing some cleaning when I came in contact with him in my office. I, will, I am willing to testify to this or sign an affidavit. Beverly Jones, and she gives her address and her city and state. 
and I have four or five other statements from friends. I have I have a statement actually from Tracy Deal, the widow of Marty Deal's uh, sister, when she and Tracy went to the jail in July and how shocked they were that all of his hair was gone. So all these years I have taken proof to them, a letter from Marty's mother, which states plainly that on August the 21st, Marty's last birthday, which was five days before Heather, that he was walking up her backyard and she didn't even recognize him. His head was so bald. Now, now let me ask you just a few questions because Heather disappeared on August 26th. On September 1st, Marty Deal allegedly caved himself. But on the day that Heather went missing, Marty was seen in town around one o'clock. Is that correct? Yes. According to the owner of East End Pawn Shop, Don Parker, he let me know that Marty was behind his shop at a lawnmower, uh, Larry Lyons lawnmower shop, working on a working on a lawnmower. And then I have the Kentucky State Police's files, which state that he and his son Joshua were feeding the goats and that he was supposed to cut the grass that day and he was home until the afternoon when Mike Shelton, the brother-in-law picked him up. So Marty Deal wasn't even on the beach that day. Mike Shelton had borrowed his Bronco, which he had done many times in the past. So Marty Deal wasn't, not only was five foot eight, 185 pounds and bald with no pot belly, he was not six foot. He was not 210 to 230 pounds with, with a pot belly, and he didn't have bushy hair and a beard. Now, there was another suspect. Uh, well, I don't know if he, well, he was a suspect for a while. Um, Chris Bilo yes. is his name. Mm -hmm. And Chris Bilo lived how far from that beach? His mother lived right there in Reed. It was right there on the beach. That is that is Christopher Belo's picture. And that's the sketch. Look at the, the way his hands turn in. He has a genetic yeah. quirk where your your hands turn in. Mm -hmm. It's identical. Look, the belly. Yep, it's identical from the sketch to that. And you're absolutely right. And see, now, the, only, the only thing Tim Wathaw could have seen with that telescope from across the river in 15 to 20 seconds would have been the body. So now, no, I wanted to play that 911 call. Okay, so are you ready to hear it? Yes, that's fine. Okay, let's play the 911 call. Ooh. <laughs> Hold on a second, let me get it. the beach or straight across from the beach from the lock and dam. Mm -hmm. And there was a girl on the left hand side. Hold on, I'm starting from the beginning. Sorry. I had to listen to it twice. All right. I Indiana State Police. I live in Newburgh, Indiana. Mm -hmm. And I mean I was sitting at the dinner table, we got to eating dinner and I got a telescope. I live right on the river. Mm -hmm. And I scanned the beach or straight across from the beach from the lock and dam. Mm -hmm. And there was a girl on the left hand side of the trees down here and she was sunbathing and she was laying face down. And she had her top done, and she was just bathing. And uh, I was looking back and forth across the beach. I told Karen, I, and I said, you know, I just missing to her. I said, I, you know, I just looking at the beach. And about this time, a guy come running out of the trees on the left-hand side. And he ran down and grabbed her by the back of the head of the hair and jerked her up. And she grabbed the towel, and he he, he, he walked her up in the trees up on, in the riverbank over here. Mm -hmm. And I've been watching now for 25 minutes, and I ain't seen her come back. And all of herself still sat down there on the beach. Where is she at on the beach, sir? She was, you know where the new lock and dam is? The new bird lock and dam? Yes, sir. Uh, right straight on that big, long beach, and she's almost at the end of the lock wall on your side, on the Kentucky side. End of the lock wall? Well, I'm at the end of the lock wall. I'm right straight across on the Indiana side where the, where the new lock wall ends. Mm -hmm. And she was right there at that end. Now, I swear this guy looked like he had a gun. He come down, he had a chrome plate. I could see it glistening in the sun. And it looked like a revolver. And he snuck up behind.
behind her, and she was laying face down on the on the mat. And, he, and she had long hair, and he grabbed her by the head of the hair and raised her head up and showed her the gun. And then when she did, she stood up, and she grabbed the towel that was laying there, and she put it on top of it, and he marched the fun of him right up to the top of the trees. What did she look like? She was, uh, I didn't, I only had like a 25 on, on, on the scope, so she was, uh, she was Caucasian, and she was, uh, she had long, kind of brownish black hair. Mm-hmm. You mean long to her shoulder, to her uh, waist, or what? Over, over her back, probably. What color was her bathing suit? Uh, she didn't have a top on, but she had a bikini bottom on. It was kind of like a multicolored flower color. There's a lounge chair. Okay, hold, hold on. Hold on, please. What? What? Like that. Talking about action, and they, they take another call. Our bottom bikini. Yeah. And all her stuff's still here. It's been 20 minutes ago, and she ain't come back yet. He marched up in the trees, and, and there were, at the time it happened, there was only one other group of people on the beach, and they were down the far right end. end. So my problem is with this when I heard that. First, he said 25 minutes. Then he said 20 minutes. But he just waited to call the police. When you first saw, I understand he may have thought it was a prank or whatever. But when you first saw that happening, why didn't he call the police then? He didn't call 911 at all. See, there there was never an official 911 call. Had he called 911, it would have taken him to Warwick County Sheriff's Department because he lives in Newburgh, Indiana. According to the August 30th issue of the Gleaner, four days after Heather was taken, it states plainly, the witness claims he called 911, but there's no record of any such call. So bottom line, she was abducted around 12 or 1230. We had to fight for 12 years to get the time and location of the call he made, which was to Indiana State Police at 115, which would have been 45 minutes at the least if not one hour and 15 minutes. So when he sees Heather being dragged into the woods, he waits one hour at least, 45 minutes to one hour and 15 minutes before he called Indiana State Police. He never did call 911. And who on earth would wait 20, 25 minutes? That's what I'm saying. Hoping they'll come back down. Okay, let's finish listening to this. What did he look like? He was kind of heavy set. Uh, he just had like a, a blue jean uh, cut off pants on and tennis shoes. And it looked, I couldn't tell if he had a full beard or if he just had real shaggy hair and or something over his face. But you couldn't what tell. What color is his hair, sir? Kind of uh, dark brown. Is he white or black? He was white. White male? Yeah. And he had a gun with him? Yes, sir. Did he, he have a shirt on? Nope, no shirt. He had what appeared to be like it was a chrome plating because it kept glistening in the sun. You know what I mean? What's her stuff look like laying there on the beach? She's got a uh, lounge chair laying there, blue and white lounge chair, and her purse and stuff was laying to the left-hand side of it, and she picked her towel up with her when she left because she had it in front of her hiding her, her breast when she walked up the beach. What did her towel look like? Uh, God, I don't know. Oh, towel. my God. Light color, dark color. Dark color kind of pinkish color, I think. And where did he take her to? There's the trees on the left-hand side, right up from where she was sunbathing. She was down this far end. He just walked right up in the trees, and they disappeared. I couldn't see them. And her stuff is laying on the beach next to the end of the wall? No, no, no. I'm at the end of the wall on the Indiana side. She's all the way across on your Kentucky side, just about where the end of the lock wall comes out, though. Okay, the wall doesn't come out over on the other side of Kentucky? No, it comes out on the Indiana side. Well, I'm not familiar with the dam. I don't know. Okay, no, I've never the been there. on the Indiana side. Uh, what's your oh, my name? God, they're W-A-L-T-H-A-L-L. arguing up nothing. W-A-L-T-H-A-L-L. 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 Your phone number is 853-9984-812 area code. And this is right across the beach from the dam. Yeah, but the, the, there's a beach on the on your side, on the Kentucky side. Yeah. It's straight across from where the dam is. Okay. Mm-hmm. And it's a big party beach. Everybody goes over there all the time. Where they, and she was kind of down to the far end of it towards the, the dam end. So let me get this right. I still don't hear where he has anybody on the way there. They're arguing about what side of the river or whatever it is on. Still, I don't hear him placing any calls to get anybody on the way out there. You know, or am I missing that? The state police were already there. Listen to this. I don't think I even told you this. 
there was a truck stuck in the mud the night before. And at the time Heather was abducted, that truck started leaking gasoline. So they Mm -hmm. called the Kentucky State Police and the Kentucky State Police came to investigate the gas leak. They got hung up. They got hung up at the place called The Point. So the state police had already just had left the the beach when he called. State police were already there. At the time Heather was abducted, the truck starts leaking gasoline. Okay, hold on. Let's finish this. Yeah, and uh, she was in pretty close to where some trees come out on the end of the of the sand or the where the beach where the trees run out here and she was just off to the right of that. This is an and eight minute call, seriously. Where he came out of and walked over there and ran over there actually and, and she was laying face down, uh sunbathing, uh, with her belly down. And he snuck up behind him, grabbed by the head of the hair and raised her head up and looked at me like he showed her a gun. That's when I saw the gun glistening. Mm-hmm. And then she jumped up when she did she grabbed his mouth put it in front of her and then he walked with his hand straight out in front of her by her, and had her by the head of the hair in front of him and he was walking you could see the gun glistening in the, in the sunlight mm-hmm. and he walked her straight to the trees and that's on the beach right across the river from the dam oh my yes, god sir. all right sir we'll have someone check it i mean i please i mean I, maybe it's nothing but god damn it right, 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 right. all right sir we'll have someone check it all right thank you okay so tim walthall tell us about tim walthall Tim Walthall was president of Four Star Fabricators in Petersburg, Indiana. He has a twin brother, Tom, that was vice president. He was, I thought he was my hero. Every time I would show up at Post 16, he would be there. He was always involved. I found out later that he uh, was actually at the trailer the night that Marty Dill died. Um, Like I say, he's the one, he and the lieutenant found Heather's bathing suit bottoms. He told me he he told us for 20 years that the way that heather was abducted is not what he says on that call he told us that the man crept down slowly to where heather lay and was whispered to her as he put his hand flat on her back and as they were talking he was wrapping her hair around his wrist he said he the story was that he jerked her up her little feet were dangling from the ground Mm-hmm. She couldn't scream because her hair was wrapped so tightly around his wrist. In this call, he says the man charges down, not crept down slowly. But the most important thing, Heidi, is that they kept this call from us for 20 years. And when and how did you get the call? When there was a sergeant, Sergeant Jason Pagan. I had he was new on Heather's case in 2015 and 16. And I had called him with my concerns that we had heard a call in 2008 where Mm -hmm. Tim Walthall was talking to a female and he was describing Marty Deal. He he said he wore a wig and a mosquito netting. Well, my daughter Mm -hmm. Holly literally laughed out loud because, you know, by that by that time, we had already had positive proof Marty was bald. And Tim Walthall had told me that I met him on November the 22nd of 95. First time I I had been in his home and Mm -hmm. he called me into the kitchen and he said, Marty Deal wore a mosquito netting. And I said, where did that come from? And he said, Dave, Dave, which is David Osborne, the lieutenant. Mm -hmm. So Marty Deal had been the only suspect in a rape in July of 94. Mm -hmm. And that was, it was broad daylight and he wore a mosquito netting. Okay, so this call that we heard in 2008 was with a female. And this call, I have just filed a Freedom of Information appeal because the call that we heard in 2008 is gone. It it has disappeared. I have the record of the date of the call, which they have the, the, the day wrong. They have the date of the meeting wrong. They have it as March the 20th. 7th of 08 and it was august the 27th of 08 which i have a picture a dated picture of chip my attorney uh and my daughter holly were standing in front of state police post 16. of course i would have never forgotten that date because it was the day after the 13 year anniversary that heather was taken but bottom line is the the call we heard in 2008 has disappeared the Kentucky State Police stood in front of Judge Shepard in 2017 
and said there was only one call, which plainly there's two different calls. Two different calls. So I'm looking at <clears throat> I'm looking at the police report. OK, well, the Federal Bureau of Investigation. So hold on a second. Let me let you guys see this. Um, Sarah has pulled everything. Now, I want to let you guys know that she had to declare Heather deceased in order for her to be able to get access to these records. Is that correct? Yes. The FBI came to me in 2005. This was 10 years after Heather was taken. They came to me saying that the evidence that they had given to the state police that was taken from the Bronco, the evidence they had given the state police was still sitting at post 16. They hadn't sent the evidence off for 10 years. So they wanted me to get an attorney. They wanted me to sue the Kentucky State Police, and they wanted Heather's case to go federal. From the FBI files that I have, I believe Heather's case was already a federal one, but they wanted me to sue the Kentucky State Police for malice neglect, and they said that all that would have to be done would be my attorney filing the, the civil suit or filing the lawsuit, and the judge was, would immediately issue a gag order as long as I wouldn't ever speak about the Kentucky State Police again. Five million dollars. Five million dollars. So you, but all you had to do was sign it and you don't talk about the KSB. Now on this FBI file, they said the incident type is kidnapping drug related. Right. Before we go any further, would exactly. you like to explain that? that? You caught that. Right. How did, did they know? Yeah, you, you, you caught that. Mm -hmm. And the public boat ramp was not Newburgh Beach. The yeah. public so, boat ramp is where Heather met James Hendricks. Okay, Hendricks. so let's not get to James Hendricks yet. Okay. <laughs> okay, wait a minute. So they're saying that the incident happened at 3 p.m., which is incorrect. Heather was abducted between 12 and 1230. Heather was already... Uh, go, she was seen in a red Chevette between 2.30 and 3 on August the 26th. Yes, this is... Uh, okay. They're saying that the police contacted 5 p.m. FBI was contacted on 8.27 at 9 a.m. Uh, FBI assistance was requested. Mm -hmm. The victim was last seen on 8.26, 19.95 at 3 p.m. So here they're saying was a vehicle used, they said unknown, but they said was a weapon used. The answer yes. was yes. So this is the official, this is an FBI report, Federal Bureau of Investigations. And notice at the top right corner, it says WP program. Yep. Witness protection program. Mm -hmm. Now, you and I have talked about this now. First of all, we want to talk about Heather for a minute. Um, you flat out told me that Heather was, she used methamphetamine. Yes. She was dating a drug dealer. Right. Who was 42? 42, 43, yes. Okay. She, he, was, he was the same age as me. I was I was 42 at the time. Okay. And she was 23 at um, oh, when she disappeared. She was okay. Crazy. So yeah. it is a it's it was alleged that Heather was working as a CI. Well, from all the evidence that we have now, knowing that she had met James Hendricks the night before she was abducted, and we'll, we'll get into how the FBI yeah. came to my home. But I don't think you noticed that it's well, maybe you did because you have you pulled through these files. Do you notice they said this case is closed? That is Jerry Garner's ID number. That is the FBI. As far as the FBI is concerned, I guess it, it I, yes, I did notice that. And I have asked questions about that because I know that's Jerry Garner, the FBI man that came to me in 2005 telling me to get an attorney to sue the state police. Um, 
And this was dated 2000. Is this a 2007 document? It was yeah. dated 2007, but it was actually filed uh, July, I mean, January 31st, 2003. Right. This is when it was filed, but uh, it's dated from when they, clo I guess this is their closure of the file. So, but when I saw this kidnapping and drug related, I'm like, okay. So we're going to get to the fact that the the person that she was dating, you told me that um, he's still around, right? He, yes, he's still alive. Yes. So what is he, and they know for sure that he had nothing to do with this, correct? He wasn't there. No, and he's a little bitty thing. He's like five, seven. He, he, he wasn't, I don't know if he helped orchestrate it or whatever, but no, he, he wasn't. He wasn't the one that took Heather. Okay. So we're going to get to this. So we have another FBI. So guys, I have another FBI thing and I hadn't uploaded it yet, but let me, because we're going to do this in parts and trust me, we need to do this in parts because it's so much. Mm -hmm. So this is from the FBI and they oh let me get back to my email and this is directly from the fbi they stated that there's public corruption okay public corruption um the fbi states that the writer has assisted detective and they redacted his name on several different witness interviews since july of this year additionally the writer has rendered assistance in an area of logical and lead formulation but related strategy presently attention is primarily being focused on the strong possibility of drug prostitution strip club public corruption linked to heather teague's uh, abduction. They're also saying that pu public officials in that area are known to be hard on violators that use methamphetamines in order to protect their cocaine business. So the FBI is stating that the police in Kentucky was in the business of cocaine. Is that, this is what I'm reading. Well, Tim Wathall, the eyewitness, he has businesses in South America. And right before the year anniversary, he brought Eddie Jones as his attorney, which I don't know why he would need an attorney, but Eddie Jones, Paul Lloyd, a strip club owner, and uh, Mike Heron were all busted for cocaine in 2002. So now we're going to get into James Hendricks. OK, so they're stating, which I showed you guys the FBI file, that she was last seen at 3 p.m. on August 26. James Hendricks at that time was a police officer. Henderson. And Hendrickson, sir, yes. he supposedly or allegedly his wife told someone that James had seen Heather around 3 a.m. in the morning at the boat dock. Is that correct? Hayes boat ramp, yes. Okay. Now, in case you guys don't know anything about James Hendricks, after he was a police officer in Kentucky, he became an FBI agent who was known as a predator at the FBI office in New York. Um, he has a 52 page report of being a predator. One woman stated that she would carry a ruler around with her because just to hit his hands, because he was always, uh, trying to reach for her legs or her breast. Um, he, he was would tell it pornography. I forgot to tell you that when the. When Jerry Garner brought him to my home, February the 19th of 08. Okay, but we haven't gotten there yet. Wait okay. a minute. Okay. We haven't gotten there yet. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so the FBI opened an investigation on James Hendricks. Uh, he was in their field office in Albany for all of these women. Even the men said that he would lurk 
and be looking at women up and down. He had harassed, sexually harassed, eight females that were subordinates to him. And this, the FBI called this is uh, egregious uh, sexual misconduct. But this is the killer part. They let this predator retire at 50 years old with full benefits. But now he writes a blog. Uh, let's see. So he has no disgrace, no, no thing except for that 52 page um, investigation they did. He was a predator at work. So when she was telling me about James Hendricks and I was like, okay. And she asked me, did I look him up? And I said, well, yeah, but he wasn't fired. She goes, he wasn't? I said, no, he retired. And they're, th and they're stating that it was ugly, ugly, ugly. But they allowed him to retire instead of prosecuting him, instead of firing him. They allowed this man to retire. And he supervised over 200 agents. Now, at the time, like I said, he met with uh, Heather, allegedly. Um, it was in the wee hours of the morning. So then when the rumors started circulating that he had met with Heather, he goes to Sarah's home. Go ahead, Sarah. Okay. In 2008, I got word from james Hendricks's wife that he had met heather the night before which was in the wee hours of the morning so the fbi were t the fbi came in in 2005 to tell me to get an attorney to sue the state police mm -hmm. and then they stayed for two and a half years in january of 08 the last of january i had turned in the taped conversations that i had made with tim Walthall to this Kentucky State Police. Chip and I went and had a meeting and turned 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 the recorded- uh, Now Chip is your attorney. He is our family attorney. Okay, yeah. okay. He, he, he yes. And so they, the FBI were immediately taken off Heather's case and Jerry Garner, the FBI man, let me know. He said, Sarah, they, they've just taken us off Heather's case. He said, but I won't be far away. This was in, uh, 2008 yeah okay so when i got this message and that heather had met this james hendrix the night the night before i called jerry and i said jerry you know heather a man named james hendrix henderson police officer had met heather the night before he said call john nevels there would have been a report filed mm -hmm. i called john nevels hendrix's boss at the time and john nevels told me plainly Yes, it was in the wee hours of the morning that she was abducted. I wish we could have arrested her. We did not make a report. So I called Jerry Garner back and I said, Jerry, they're saying there wasn't a report filed. He said, yes, there would have been. So I called John Nevels back again. No, we, we wish we could have arrested her for something and this wouldn't have happened. We all talked about it in the office, you know, the and that's when she was on the beach and because she was on the beach in the wee hours of the morning. She was on Hayes boat ramp, the wee Hayes, Hayes boat ramp. ramp. Okay. Where, where, yeah, she wasn't abducted. She wasn't on the beach until 10 or 11 that day. She was abducted between 12 and 1230. Okay. So the next thing I know now the FBI are already off Heather's case. The next thing I know, Jerry Garner is bringing James Hendricks, who is now FBI Milwaukee. Now he was FBI Bluegrass, Arkansas at that mm -hmm. time. He was head of pornography. So Jerry Garner, Money. yeah, I forgot to tell you that. Uh, <laughs> Jerry Garner brings James Hendricks to my home. Of course, I have recorders all over the house. Jerry Garner knew I was notorious for recording conversations. And uh, he acted like a cat on a hot tin roof. Jerry's normally really relaxed. He was jumpy. He was nervous. And so I asked James Hendricks, I said, why are you here? And he said, I came to clear up a rumor. 
He said, I saw your daughter three weeks prior to her abduction, not the morning of the night before. Okay. See, Jerry Garner knew what he was going to tell me. Jerry Garner knew I had already called John Nevels and John Nevels had confirmed. Yes, it was the night before. When I get the state police's files, there is an entry where James Hendricks had seen Heather August the 23rd, which was three days prior. He had Not admitted, weeks before. He admitted to seeing her three weeks prior. So, and he saw her the night before. So to me, that establishes an ongoing relationship. Plus, they were both seen at parties, bringing in. Tell us about the parties that, please. James Hendricks and Heather were allegedly seen. I have uh, statements from several people that J uh, Heather and James Hendricks would come together at parties and they would bring drugs. So at the time, James Hendricks was a police officer with Kentucky State Police. Kentucky police Department. Yes. And when you say post 16, that's the Kentucky State Police. That's post Kentucky State Police. That's a different branch than the okay. police department. Okay. Got you. So when the FBI put in their report that there was public corruption with officials that, that were um, enforcing methamphetamine, methamphetamine violations, but in order to let their cocaine, cocaine, look, cocaine business flourish. And James Hendricks was a part of that. Allegedly, allegedly, could be. I, I I don't know. All all I know is, uh, a detective from New York, Gil Alba, came in when the mm -hmm. FBI came in, and he let he let us know immediately that he knew for a fact that state police post sixteen were filing for grant money for methamphetamine and using it for cocaine, somehow or other. You know the the grant thing. I, I don't, I don't, I don't know, but so they were, so they were filing for a grant to combat methamphetamines, but they were really going to use the money for something else. For cocaine. Yeah. It, it was specifically mentioned cocaine, which is what Eddie Jones, who is Tim Walthall's attorney, Mike mm -hmm. Heron and Paul Lloyd, the owner of the strip club were all busted in 2002 for cocaine. Okay. Now when we were talking about, well, I mentioned Chris Big Bilo, okay? Chris Bilo uh, had actually confessed in 1991 to a murder of his girlfriend at the time. Now, my question was, when Heather was abducted in 95, was Chris Bilo out of jail? Chris Bilo wasn't convicted and didn't start his sentence until what 2003 um, that's what i thought okay right right he 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 uh detective uh, scott thomas from medina ohio mm -hmm. came in 2005 see this is what prompted the fbi to get involved because when detective thomas came in from ohio to express his concerns that chris Bilo could have had a part in heather's abduction could have been the one who abducted heather because Catherine Fetzer, the girl that he did admit to murdering, her body was never found. And four other missing girls, they were all short, green eyes, and long, dark hair. Plus, Christopher Bilo lived right there at Reed, right there on the beach. His mother lived right there. And, of course, he is identical to the composite sketch. So when, when Scott Thomas came in from Ohio to express his concerns about Christopher Bilo, that's when the evidence was found at post 16, having not been sent off for 10 years. So that's when the FBI came to me and said, and that's why they came is because the evidence had just sat there for 10 years. So when I saw the picture of Chris Bilo, Okay, and I'm trying to find it again because I thought, I thought, I thought, I thought I pulled it. But he does fit the description. He did have the hair on his face. Oh, let okay. me tell you something else. See, this is what I caught. 
when he's got the he's got those tattoos and you caught that too. Yep. Okay. So I, I thought the eyewitness would have seen the tattoos. Well, guess what? His mother, I mean, his Chris Bilo's dad and stepsister came to my home and they let me know that Chris Bilo did not have these tattoos in 95. He left the very night Marty Deal was killed, went to Georgia and got the tattoos. So this 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 is who took Heather. According yep. to this sketch. So let me show you the picture of um Chris Bilo. And hold on. This is the picture of Chris Bilo that I found. Is that Chris Bilo? That's 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 Christopher Bilo. Uh he's now posing as a dog groomer on Facebook. He has short hair, he has glasses. He has a little bow tie. He looks like a school teacher or a professor. Now, let me tell you what I caught in that call that uh, that Tim Whitelaw made. He said he couldn't tell if he had a beer, beard or not, or if it was his hair. So that picture right there, you see a little beard, but not like that bushy beard that was supposedly drawn in that they used Marty Deal's driver's license right. to do. Right. Yeah, so the, the, he said the hair was long. There it is. Mm. He said brown. There it is. That is the man that I'm thinking that probably did take your daughter. I think so, too. Because when I went looking for a picture of him, I was like, wait a minute. Well, said, hold on. Tim Wathaw actually picked Christopher Bilo from a lineup in 2004. Three times. Three different times. But it, it was a picture. It was a, a photo lineup. So they, mm -hmm. covered, they covered the face up. And he picked Chris Bilo out of the lineup three times, but when they removed the face, he said, "Oh, it was it was Marty Deal." You know, he went to the morgue and identified Marty as being the one that took Heather. His back of his head was blown away. He had chopped all of his hair off with scissors, and according to Marty's mother and the autopsy report, there wasn't even an exit wound. That wasn't an exit wound. Marty's mother even said. In a uh, letter that she sent to you mm -hmm. that uh, she didn't even recognize him when he showed up in the backyard because he had no hair. And when he supposedly unalived himself, there was no exit wound. Mm -mm. And there you was have a small bullet hole, according to his mother. There was just a small bullet hole. And so, you know, Tim Wathall's whole story. The back of his head was blown away. He chopped his hair off with scissors. None of that's true. And even, even the way that he described Heather being taken was not true. And, you know, you would think when he positively picked Chris Bilo from the lineup in 2004 that something would have been done. You but know? nothing has happened. Because so they're not going to admit Marty Deal was bald. They're not going to admit Marty Deal was not the man that took Heather. Now. You sent me um, an email from Debbie Jewel Blackwell. Mm -hmm. Debbie is who? Tracy Deal, the widow's best friend. Okay. So I have this email and let me share it because I want to. This is a whole lot. Yes, Chris is still alive. He's the dog groomer. On he's Facebook. In, he's in Ohio, as the last I heard. And last summer, or maybe summer before last, he, he was released from prison on November the 13th of 21. Okay, so I'm going to have to zoom in so you guys can see this. I got to make this bigger. Okay. Okay, can you guys read that? Okay, so. This is from January 3rd, 2017, correct? Yes. And this is to Sarah T., which is you. It says, to whom it may concern, my name is Debbie Jewel Blackwell. And I want to say that I knew Marvin Marty Deal and that in July and August of 1995, 
Marty was clean shaven with his hair buzzed very, very short. He did not have bushy hair or a beard, which we saw in the picture. I know this because I seen him almost every day. I had known him, his then wife, Tracy Carter Deal, since 1987. I also knew Mike Shelton of Robards. I have known Mike and his sis two sisters since we were in grade school. Mike later became friends with my then husband. Mike came to our house visiting many times. So when he came beating on our door on Sunday morning, August 27th, 1995, demanding help from my husband, I knew something was wrong. But I had no idea how wrong. Mike was standing on my porch and he was acting very strange. He was pacing back and forth and he was very agitated. I told him that my husband was not at home and I had no idea when he would be home. This is the wee hours of the morning. When the hell was your husband? I asked him, what did he need? He says that his truck is hung up down in the bottoms and he needed someone to guide it while he pulled it out. He said to me, you can do it for me. I told him my kids were at home and that I was not leaving them. Mike got mad and called me a few choice words, who, but I knew I wasn't going with him. He scared me quite a, quite a lot. I finally got him to leave after he cussed me. Unbeknown to me, this was the very next morning after Heather Teague went missing. I didn't know anything about it then, but after the news about Marty committing S broke, I immediately thought about Mike and his hung up truck. I immediately went to the Kentucky State Police in Henderson and told them about, about Mike Sheldon coming to my house, needing help with his truck. The officer that I talked to did not seem to think it was important. He didn't write anything down, not even my name. I told him my name twice, but he did not write it down. He just ushered me out and said he would be in touch if he needed me. How could he get in touch with me? He out and said he would be in touch if he needed me. How could he get in touch with me? He didn't write my name down. Damn, she wrote that twice. <laughs> I never heard from anyone. 21 years later, I talked to Sarah T and she asked me if I will go back to KSP, which is Kentucky State Police, and tell them my story again. Of course I did. I went back and this time my statement was recorded. They took my name and address. When the news came out that Marty Deal had asked himself, I went to check on Tracy Deal as she was then my friend. I went to her mother's house in Spotsville and she got in my car. We drove down the road a little ways and we pulled over and just sat and talked. Tracy was crying really hard. See, she proceeded to say that on Saturday morning, of Heather's disappearance that she asked Marty to mow their yard. She said he was outside trying to get the lawnmower started. She looked out the window and she saw Mike Sheldon pull up and was talking to Marty. She said she hurried to get dressed so she could go outside to tell Marty to leave with Mike, to not to leave with Mike. But by that time she got outside, they were already gone. She said she didn't hear from them the rest of the day till way, till way up into the night. Now, this is where she really starts to crying badly. She's in my back seat, just rocking back and forth. She then says, when I seen the truck, all I can do was scream. It was all such a mess. All I could do was scream. By the time I could no longer understand what she was saying because she was crying so hard. I was worried about her. So I took her back to her mother's house. 
After I left there, I didn't see Tracy anymore. It was like she was avoiding me. I didn't go to Marty's funeral because if he did this to Heather Teague, I didn't want any part of it. When I heard about the cops questioning Tracy, I figured she didn't want to say anything about what she told me. And that's probably why I hadn't seen her. I've not talked to Tracy since that day, nor did I see Mike Sheldon again either. So let me just say this before you explain this. So Sarah said on August 25th, 1974, Heather was 23 months old and she wrote in her journal, I am so afraid a big man will someday take my Heather away. She wrote this in August 25th, 1974, when Heather was 23 months old. On August 26th, 1995, Heather was 23 years old when a big man took her Heather away. Oh my God. And she has her journal. She's been journaling for the longest. So could you please tell us about this whole situation with Tracy? Tracy, Tracy pled the 5th on November the 7th of 95, just a few weeks after Heather was taken. So I started writing Tracy letters. Mm -hmm. I started I started sending her letters with Heather's picture on the back because I knew she probably wouldn't open them, but I wanted her to see Heather's face. I threw letters. I threw lavender ribbons in her yard. I put Heather's picture on trees in the back of their house, the, their trailer. And um, I was taken to court for harassment in March of 96, seven months after Heather was taken the Kentucky State Police and Tracy Deal. Tracy took letters to the state police to show them that I was asking, asking her if Heather was still screaming seven hours after she was taken because at eight o'clock, August the 26th, that the night Heather was taken, four loud, hurtful screams were reported to the Kentucky State Police post-16 from neighbors of the Deals, Clarence, Crowley and Joyce Trainer called the state police and reported that they heard four loud, hurtful screams. So I started writing Tracy letters, begging her, would you just please tell me who was screaming? Was Heather still screaming? That was my main thing. You know, was Heather still screaming? Mm -hmm. So 20 years later, I found out that Tracy Deal was the one who was screaming. The state police were standing outside of the courtroom to testify against me. I was facing 90 days in jail for seven or nine counts of harassing communications. So, so 20 years later, I find out that Tracy, Tracy was the one who was screaming. Tracy was, was the one that was, that was her screaming. It not Heather. It wasn't Heather. And for me to know that she saw a mess, she saw something in that vehicle that made her scream she saw something. She either saw Heather's body. She saw blood. She saw evidence of something that made her scream. Tracy was granted complete immunity in 2006. I thought for months, I mean years, actually, I've got letters that I wrote to the Congress and senators trying to get her granted immunity. So she would tell me who was screaming. I didn't, you know, I, I thought it was Heather for 20 years. So but it was her. And I, then she Tracy also threatened to K you, didn't she? Yes, we were we were looking for Heather uh, across the road from from the deal trailer one day, and I came outside, and she came outside, and she goes like this: she goes, "Pow! When I get off probation, you're a dead woman." So here I write Tracy letters asking her if Heather was still screaming. They take me to court for harassment. She was on probation and threatened my life, and they did nothing. So she's been granted immunity since 2006, and I just cannot fathom 
how they cannot ask her. See, we could have answers where Heather is. We could have answers what happened to Heather, but we don't because the state police still protect Tracy Deal. <coughs> so you sent me another piece of, um, and this is coming from the FBI as well. Is that correct? Where we have Ernie Green's name redacted all through here? That may be the state police files. I, I'm not sure. Let me see that again. No, that one. Okay, hold on. Let me show it to you. Hold think, on. Hold on. Right, it is the FBI. It's the FBI. Right. Because, yeah, okay. So this is the FBI. So it was saying that a source had told us yes, that source. Mark Deal's dead. Well, you go ahead and read it. Okay, hold on. Let me let me get over here, woman. Hold on. This can, it, I mean, it's so much to all of this. It's, oh, it's so much. It's a lot. And like we, we were talking earlier, this is not a one-time thing. We're going to have to break this up in segments. So this was dated 12-14-2005. And it kept saying a source, a source learned that an unidentified prostitute was aimed in Henderson area in recent years, allegedly... Uh, the individual had a needle in her arm at the time of the death. The murderer was somehow covered up as it did not appear in the newspaper. Source will attempt to obtain more information uh, uh, regarding this apparent crime. So Ernie Green's name, excuse me, of Henderson, Kentucky, is also a frequent customer at Uncle Sam's Strip Club, previ previously described by the source. Here we go again. Ernie Green, Henderson Police Department, who's who has a very bad reputation, re, excuse me, a reputation at the time of the Heather T kidnapping, was involved in the drug ring previously described by the source. Sir Strong doubts that Marty Deal. So here they say, source strongly doubts that Marty Deal, a T case uh, suspect committed S since Ernie Green was there with him at the time of his death has been very low key ever since the kidnapping. Ernie Green was allegedly a part of some type of organized crime group approximately five to six years ago. Ernie Green apparently did not pay on the debt and someone had his physic had him physically beaten for this reason. Ernie Green was hospitalized for several weeks as a result of a bad eye injury and wore an eye patch for many months afterwards. And here's what they have to say. <laughs> the source has heard that certain public officials in Henderson strongly enforce methamphetamine violations in an effort to promote and protect their own cocaine business. Hmm. What you got to say about that? I know how, what great lengths they've gone to to protect this eyewitness, his description, the call, the calls that he made. It, it, it's incomprehensible to me as a decent human being that I could go to them year after year after year and present evidence that Marty Deal was not the man the witness described. And they deny the evidence. They ignore the evidence. They go so far as to threaten to stop all communication with me if I didn't stop demanding that they admit Marty Deal was bald. Now, tell them about when you would go to the police station, when you would go to Kentucky, I mean, to the state police, and they see you coming in there. Tell them what they would say and do. Well, one time I was on my way in there and, and uh, a lieutenant whispered loud enough that I could hear. He said, here she comes again with that poster. And I stood in front of them and would, would show them do you not see that that's identical? Can you not see that's identical? No, no. And 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 this picture here with his bald, they laughed and said, he's got his hair pulled back in a ponytail. 
And I, I would leave in such frustration because I had already proven to him that Marty Dill was bald. He was not the man the witness described. Are we going to get into the uh, audio, the KSP audio where uh, Bill Polk is telling them that he's. Yes, I'm going to try to play it. So I need you guys, if you have headsets on, I'm going to play this for you so you can tell us uh, what we're going to hear on the audio and tell them how you found the audio, please. Yes. On July the 27th of last year. I was so frustrated. This is what I do all day, every day. I wake up in the middle of the night thinking of things I need to do. I, I get up and come to Heather's room and write it down. So on July the 27th at noon, I was so frustrated from filing open records and, and getting nothing back. And uh, I walked down the hall and I said, God, please just let me have Heather back. And these words came to me. I immediately got an ink pen and wrote it down. There is an undeniable truth coming. They can no longer deny and they will have no choice but to tell our family. On July the 29th, two days later, I sat down in Heather's room at the computer. I opened the Kentucky State Police audio files and I go straight to a file labeled Tracy underscore DUI underscore reviewed. I open it and I'm telling you, I started shaking so hard. I had to take two baths because I knew God had just given me something so powerful because there it was in their own words and audio with Bill Polk, the deal's attorney telling the Kentucky state police on day four before Marty deals death. He's saying, don't surround him. He said, Marty's in delicate condition. He said, let me go in, wait till daylight and let me go in. And the first thing I want to do is ask him about Heather. He says, Marty doesn't fit that description. He said, Marty is shorter. He's lighter. And he does not have bushy hair or a bushy beard. Okay. So as you see, this is what she sent to me. Cause when she sent it, I'm like, what does Tracy DUI review have to do with anything? There's she not said, one Did you listen to it. I said, <laughs> I didn't know what it had. So I'm going to play it. I want you guys to listen to these police officers. Talk about this. I know, but I mean, I know. That's what I find. See, he told me. Uh, he came right out and said, you know, I've got to record him, okay? Yeah. Hey, Bill. You know Robbie, don't you? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Pretty mild. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we took, I think, his definition. That's what he said. Civil, civil case, dude. Where are you going to go? I want to talk and to somebody. I, am I, want somebody. Working. I want to talk to somebody and talk to you. I, I don't want to talk to any, uh, any, uh, body to help make a, they swap the like that. Good afternoon. Doing well, well, you know, Bill, don't you? Yeah, we have. Civil depositions, I think, about that. And if y'all rather me not be present, I'll be not present. I don't care. Yes, sir. Come on. Bill, I don't hate walking in here if these old boots on. <laughs> well, let me set, Bill. It doesn't matter. So I'm in a little bit of a ethical bind in, in this case. The, An ethical bind. We're talking about the murder case. I assume it's a murder case. Uh, 
And I, and I think y'all were y'all were focusing in on uh, on Mar uh, Marty Bill. I think he's uh, that's what I'm that's what I'm here about. Um, I have in the past uh, represented Marty, uh, uh, Marty and his wife Tracy in a uh, marijuana case. In a marijuana a case. City, city case. Um, I consider both of them uh, to be my clients in, 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 in this situation. I also, and, and along with being my, them, them being my clients, I'm under some really, really stringent confidentiality and ethical restrictions. Uh, I have had no contact with Marty. I have some concerns about his well-being. Um, his wife, Tracy, has some uh, very real concerns. Uh, as you know, uh, Marty has a, a Bronco that meets the, uh, meets the description. Um, I can tell you where Marty is, and uh, we, Tracy and I, uh, no, no one else probably is going to be able to get him out. We, we don't know whether he's living or dead. Um, the reason. Now, he just said that he, uh, this is Marty's attorney and Tracy's attorney. He's represented them on a marijuana charge. He says that. Marty's Bronco matches the description and Tracy has some concerns about his well-being. Mm -hmm. He's offering to go in, but they don't know if he's going to uh if he's alive or dead. So he's going there telling them, talking to the police. Am I correct on that, Sarah? Yes. Okay. So let's finish listening. And I want to talk to someone with us that I know and talk to someone with locally and not outside the uh, not a total stranger is that I know we ought to focus in on him and uh, are going to take him into custody uh, but I would like this I would like him to be taken into custody alive and that I mean, that means uh, some real discretion, you know, some real restraint on the part of law enforcement. If we go in with helicopters, SWAT teams, big show of force, it's going to be counterproductive, I think. He has not been. Uh, seen or contacted since about 5 30 yesterday afternoon and we don't know you know what is uh whether he's alive or dead his wife tracy does not want to go through another night not knowing um she wants wants him out he's, he's in the last community he's at, he's at home um there are dogs there, and uh, that I'm told that if anyone goes around, the dogs will raise, raise the alarm. Uh, we don't know whether or not he's armed. He possibly may have a 22 pistol. Uh, we believe most of the uh, uh, firearms that he used to have before his conviction. Okay, so he said he believes he had a 22 pistol. A 22 pistol is not going to blow the back of your head out. No. Not at all. Okay. I just heard he said he may have a shotgun or, you know, but he's known to have a 22 pistol. 22 pistol is not going to blow the back of your head out. Well, the autopsy okay. report confirms that there wasn't even an exit wound. Wasn't even an exit wound. Okay. Taken away pursuant to the terms of his uh, uh, probation. But he may, may possibly have a, uh, 
a 22 caliber pistol. Uh, don't need the loner. Uh, is uh, the only person I'm told, and, and from my previous contacts with him, this sort of uh, fits. I, I don't know if there's anyone that he trusts or anyone he would open up to. There's no pastor, teacher, friend, uh, family member that we know of that. Uh, um, possibly could talk to him. Maybe his father, Marvin, but they they have been strange, estranged <coughs> for uh, some years. Uh, I'm told that in the past few months the relationship has has gotten closer. Uh, Does they wear all this? What? Does his father wear all this? I don't know. I haven't talked. We don't. I haven't talked to his, to uh, Marvin. And I don't. And uh, apparently, it's hard to find. He works works so many hours, so many places that uh, that uh, he's hard to catch up with. Uh, we can try. You know, we can try to find him. So here's my question. I'm gonna stop you for a minute. The, the attorney is there negotiating with surrendering Marty to them and not going in with helicopters and everything. My question is, how did you mislabel this tape to read Tracy underscore DUI underscore reveal? Were they trying to hide something? Was this intentionally done? You think? There's two other uh, audios that are labeled Bill Pope dated October the 17th of 95 and October the 19th of 95. You can't hear a word on, on either. Yes, they purposely put this on there because when I opened it, there's not one. You'll listen to the rest of the call. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to listen to it. So Bill Paul is the attorney that went to negotiate his surrender. There did is you, no... Huh? Did you also catch that he said, I don't know any family members that could go in. Yep, now, I heard him say he that. He mentioned Ernie Green as being yeah. even a possibility of somebody that could get him out alive. But the thing is, how do you mislabel this tape? When you have two others that you said you can't hear anything, this audio is Chris. When I first played it, it was kind of low. Then it got cleaner. This was intentionally mislabeled to me. There is no way. Because, uh, yes, <laughs> this is not the only thing they've mislabeled. Uh, okay, let's finish listening to it. Uh, I'm concerned. I'm concerned about uh, about him being being brought out half alive, and if he's not already done something, he does have he does have some knives. Uh, he has knives now I, too. I assume he's that in a twenty-two kitchen, Damn. kitchen uh, knives there. Tracy did not see a gun. He did not threaten her anyway. Um, but. Uh, um, she was told to leave, you know, one certain time. So she and her son, their son, are, are staying, uh, you know, where they're staying. Uh, I don't know. I don't know what, uh, I, I know you've got, uh, you've got limitations, uh, just like I've got limitations. But, my concern is, is that if we get get him out of there, maybe daylight. I don't know. I, I, I can't. I can't believe that going in there at night is going to do anything but but harm. I don't want any. I don't want. I don't want anyone else hurt, and don't want him hurt. And. Uh, I'm open to uh, open to suggestions. I will be glad to try to talk to him. I, you know, I only relationship I have with him is is uh, that turn client out of the last thing. I think he trusts me, uh, but I, I don't want to, you know, represent myself as being a bosom buddy and 
and, and all this, I, I would I would be willing, preferably in daylight, to uh, try to talk to him. Uh, I've called I've called the homeless to watch it. Um, like I say, you know, it may be, may be in my day. Well, I don't want, but I, I'm a little bit bad in the situation, I'm afraid. And I don't, and, I, and, and you know what kind of a vehicle he's got. And, uh, uh, he does not meet the description, at least the description that's been released. Okay, we heard that. Bill Poe, the attorney, is telling the police detectives that Marty does not meet the description, at least the description that has been released. Is that right, Sarah? Yes, and he goes on to tell him that he doesn't have bushy hair and a beard. Okay, let's finish listening. He is. This Bill Pope. Okay. He is shorter. He is lighter. Uh, he does not have a bushy beard. He does not have bushy hair. Oh, God. There is, uh, his beard is very short. Uh, and his hair is, I'm told, is now very short. It's not, not been that way in the past, but since uh, the marijuana trouble, he's apparently cut his hair, cut his, and I know y'all are aware of his other, other stuff too, which which is uh, is troubling. Uh, Corruption. And, I, and I, can, I, can, I can tell you that he, uh, that he did or did did not. If he uh, if he did, if he is your guy, and if we get him out of there alive, uh, I want to talk to him first. Well, of course, that's our concern too. Is Until a few things have happened here in the last, in this, today, mm -hmm. and last night, uh, our intentions were just to talk to him. Or, I, you know, our intentions were just to talk to him. Mm -hmm. uh, we had an office to go out yesterday, I believe it was yesterday. Mm -hmm. uh, Good morning, buddy. When he talked to Tracy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, yesterday, day four, yesterday. My band for you. Yeah, well, it was Uh, and you know, we had an to go out today. Mm hmm. And I don't know. I didn't get an answer. Dogs, eh? Yeah. Working on it. So, really, you know, that kind of puts us in a spot. You know, Something is going on, and, mm -hmm. and we're going to find that walking. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, I understand that, and I agree. I agree with. It. And uh, um, I'm not sure. I'm not so sure that we can wait till tomorrow. You know, this this thing keeps escalating. I don't want to. And I'm sure my boss is not going to want. Well, I think I think if you go out there, if you go out there in the dark. Uh, if he's not dead now, he will be dead. Listen to this. So, oh, oh. Bill Poe is stating that if he's not dead already, he will be dead. So, did they have any inkling that Marty was going to off himself? Or was this, see, this doesn't make any sense to me because he keeps saying he, if they just want to talk to him, there's, that's a big difference. They hadn't found Heather's body. Why would he off himself? Because he was being blamed. When that composite sketch came out 
and the film of the, the, the Bronco film was turned in, he knew that his own brother-in-law was blaming him for the entire day. He knew the state police had put his 94 driver's license on the sketch. He was being blamed. And Bill Polk was trying his best to get him out alive. And Kentucky State Police literally turned the lights off and on. I have their own report that says they turned, they surrounded the trailer, turned the lights off and on, which would agitate him. Uh huh. And there were two shots heard, an argument and yelling. This is from a, 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 a SWAT team agent who gave this report in the state police's files. There were two shots heard, yelling and an argument. So somebody was in there with him before he died, right? Uh, was Green. that Ernie Green? Ernie Green. And, and his, his, his dad had come in to bring him Ellaville and Prozac. And then his dad, uh, his dad left. Even though the dad and him had been extra, uh, ex, um, estranged. estranged. So here's the thing. If they were only going to go out to talk to him, why do they need to have snipers and all of this other shit? When I hear the lawyer ask it, they said they were just going to go talk to him. Why was all of that needed if you were just going to question him? Good question. This doesn't make any sense to me. It's like they would... They were basically um, <laughs> manipulating this man to do something. When the lawyer is sitting there asking you not to go in like that, this the the cop is saying we're just gonna we you know we just want to talk to him, which in what you're telling me is something totally different than what we're hearing right now on what happened that night. You're exactly right. Okay, so let me finish this out. Oh my God, I mean. <laughs> Going to talk to him, you don't need a whole damn cavalry. Wouldn't Jeez. you think? Wouldn't you think that as soon as Bill Pope tells them that Marty doesn't fit that description, that their strategy would change? Do you it would hear, have. Do you hear Heather's name mentioned? We need to find Heather. We yep, didn't nope. find what happened to Heather? No. Nope. They're May not, not mentioned that one. That Marty deal ending up dead is what they're talking about. And Bill Poe is telling them either he's, you know, either he's, uh, you know, he may be dead already, but he wants to try to get him out there alive. So right. he knows what headspace he's in because of Tracy. Did Let me ask a question. Did did Marty know Chris Bilo? We don't know. I, I have uh, their school records. They were in the first or third grade together. Mm -hmm. They lived right there close, but I, I have been trying to establish a connection between Marty Dill, Chris Velo, Eddie Kellogg, these other players, uh, Mike Shelton. I, I don't know. The because for Mike Shelton to go to the house and he's stuck in the bottoms and this all is starting to sound really, well, it was shady before. Now it's worse. Now that I'm thinking out loud and I'm saying it, just not reading it. Okay, so let me finish this. Or worse than that, uh, he might take, he might. Mm -hmm. at, night, I think, at night, I think the chances of something like that happening are uh, in pro, you know, the odds are 10 times if you wait a late time. He's just telling him. Well, the only problem is it's with waiting daytime because if he's there and you know, we can't, we, we, we may not be able to pay him. But, the not been our problem, been our experience. Mm -hmm. But you know, mm -hmm. yeah, that's what we talk about. Well, I'm. I'm, 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 I'm my interest, interest my, 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 my first interest is, is sort of the same as yours. I want him out. Of, I would like to get him out of there alive. His wife wants him out of there alive. Uh, Marty is uh, his state of mind right now is, is as I'm told, is uh, uh, would lead me to believe that his career 
depression and gentleness might produce more than slam bam. Yeah, was blazing. Well, I hope it don't come to that. And and I and I'm willing and I'm willing if it would if it would help to get him out, I'm willing to do what I can to try to get him out. These cops don't sound concerned. Okay, whatever. Not about Heather. You nope. haven't had any contact with him, have you? No, no, no. My contact is one. I'm well. My contact is with Tracy, not to them for her, but she's the uh, the only one I talk to, and she's very concerned. Mm -hmm. Well, <clears throat> of course, we've been going different directions with everything. I kind of want to tell anybody else, but uh, mm -hmm. The way I've been told was that Tracy was going to come talk to us, or was going to meet us somewhere and talk to us. Well, the only thing she told me is she got one call and he said there's six, what we're described as FBI agents out of her sister in law. Well, that's six what? But when, well, when you get six, when you get, when you get six, six and law enforcement going together, they got the FBI. <laughs> Not one. <laughs> <laughs> not one I, I don't. I don't. We know. have six detectives. Do I don't. I don't know. I don't. I've never known y'all to run in packs like. We don't have. Okay, let me stop this. Let me ask you a question real quick. They said when they search Deal's truck. Okay, this is what they were saying when they search his truck. They said that he had hair resembling Heather's in his truck. Uh, is that true? There's not been a hair that there were two Caucasian head hairs found on her blue towel uh, on a blue. T no, that's not true. He had guns, knives. This no. is what it's I, I know what you're talking about. You're talking about when he was pulled over in Evansville, Indiana. He he was a construction worker and he okay. had, he he had been the only suspect in that rape. He raped that girl. He I talked to her from what she described to me. I, I believe that he did rape her. Um, he was the only suspect in a rape, and it was broad daylight. That's why when the Bronco was filmed after four days, they had their suspect. They had somebody to blame, and that's what they did. And that's the rape I was talking about because they said that he had been stopped. Um, so maybe I had February wrong. But oh, you talking about February when he was pulled over at, at Haney's Corner in Evansville. Indiana uh, for uh, stalking girls or something. yes, he, he had rope, tape, and gloves, but he was a yes. construction worker. So but I, they're I saying that he, yeah, but there's, I'm telling you, when I read this other article, because mm -hmm. just like you sent me a bunch of stuff, I start, you know, I start doing some right. other research, and they said that. Uh, in his truck, in the Bronco, it was found hair resembling Heather, two guns, two knives, duct tape, rubber gloves, uh, and rope. It was found in his truck. But that was at, so So here's the weird part. They saying that that was found in his uh vehicle in february but heather wasn't deceased in february but they said the hair resembled heather's i don't i don't know which article you, i don't i don't know anything about that i don't know yeah i'm gonna tell you the article i'm gonna send it to you so you can get this straight I, 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 i've listened to a podcast that had that on there but but that's not true yes. there was nothing heather wasn't even in the picture in february so that's, that's what I'm saying. But no, they have hair similar to no, Heather's. So lot. maybe they were trying to say that he liked Heather's hair and he was uh he had art that girl that was stalking women that look like Heather, which is what I'm reading into that. Because yeah. Heather didn't disappear until August. Yeah. This happened yeah. uh uh early February. Okay, I just want to make sure because when you read all this stuff, it's so much misinformation. Oh, that's why stuff that I read, I would ask you about. So hold on, let's finish this out. Right. And that, uh, that scared her to death. Well, it was, it was out there because of what we had already heard and mm -hmm. 
I don't know what. I don't know whether she even talked to him or not. Did she call post or? I don't know, sir. No. She didn't see that. She'd been pulling up. She didn't know what to do. She called me yesterday. Well, somebody called post. Yeah. Somebody called post. I don't know. She called me yesterday morning uh, after she someone had made contact with her, I assume Tuesday. Someone called her, I think. And uh, she was going to try to get Marty to talk to me. I was going to meet, you know, if he, if he was willing to start coming anywhere and come here, whatever you want to do. And uh, I didn't hear anything more all yesterday. And today I hear that, uh, or this afternoon, I hear that she's been out of the house since uh, 5 30 last night. And uh, there's no contact. And she's, she drove past and she's reasonably she, she's reasonably sure that. It's still there. She doesn't think he'll. She doesn't think he'll leave. She, he, she's. They have only withdrawn, withdrawn, withdrawn uh, into the room type thing. They have more than one vehicle. There. No. There's no way he could live with. He had somebody else. She doesn't know who, uh, she said that he, he's, he doesn't hardly talk, you know, uh, two of them, she's, she's the one who talks, uh, she says he has no, he's not gregarious, he, has, he doesn't hang around the guys, has no close friends, but she is the only one in the elected that will ever talk to. She's the only one he ever trusts. You know. She hadn't had any contact with him since yesterday. Right, 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 right. She's scared to death. She tried to call him? Yeah, and I tried to call him. No answer. That doesn't sound good. Uh uh. Sure does. But they sound so concerned that you're going to go in there with all that firepower and all those people. Tell you where the Bronco is, is that help? Yeah. I, I, it's not, I don't. I like for you wait a morning. But I can't make it far. You know, I'm on the This is my ball. This is. You know, Bill, the thing is, what, you know, what's going to make you think that he's going to talk to you tomorrow and it'll be tomorrow night and then he has the opportunity to either get out or. Um, or whatever. Nothing makes me think that. Nothing makes me think that he's more likely. Uh, nothing makes me think that we're going to be we can be successful in the daylight. But everything tells me that you're going to be unsuccessful at night. There is no way. I can guarantee you this. There is no way that you're going to get him out of there at night time mm. by sure force. Now. We just heard what Bill said. There is no way you're going to get him out there at nighttime by a show of force. He's asking them to go during the daytime. What did they do, Sarah? They surrounded the trailer and turned the lights off and on. There was a thump under the trailer. I don't know if somebody was trying to get go under the trailer or what. They did everything that Bill Polk asked him not to, to make sure that Marty did not come out alive. Why? Because Marty Deal was not the man that did this. Marty knew where Heather was. Marty knew what happened because Mike Shelton had borrowed the Bronco. Marty Deal knew exactly what happened that day. And they made sure he did. He took his secrets to his grave. Their whole strategy should have changed as soon as Bill Polk told them that Marty didn't fit that description, and it didn't. Do you notice 
Not one word was mentioned about Heather. Still no word of Heather. Still no word. I'm listening. Not one word. They knew on day four. And their only hope right then and there was to ask Marty, like Bill Polk wanted to, where's Heather? What happened to Heather? What do you know about Heather? Now, when we finish the recording, we're going to talk about the Bronco and what you saw when you saw, uh, when you did see the vehicle. And then we're going to continue with part two next Sunday. But let's finish listening to this. Okay. If you want him out of there alive, if he's still alive, the only he shot was. you have to do that is do it in the daytime. Do it in the daytime. Well, that's not my expertise. Mine either. You know, you know, we understand what you're saying, Bill. You know, but us being able to move around at night. Uh, is easier for him not to see us if he wants to take somebody with him. If he decides to do that, we go to look we'll right there standing around in the daytime, and the opportunity is afforded to him to see what he has to uh, do if he if that's the route he has decided to take. That's real. Oh, yeah, sure. He's answering the phone as he's in the police station. Okay. Yeah. No, no, well, there's Pope is concerned yeah. about the Marty's safety. Yeah. Right now, he's thinking that you know, we would have a better chance of getting him a last bill right across the hall. I think that's all of it, right? Yeah, that's it. So we heard clear as day because it's a lot of uh, local officials that are involved too. We heard clear as day, this man, Bill Paul, the attorney that represented Marty and his wife, Tracy, in a marijuana charge stating that you would have a better chance getting him out during the daytime alive than what you would have going in at night with bells and whistles. And they did just the opposite. It was like they wanted to antagonize him. They wanted to uh, agitate him. They were manipulating the situation, uh, hoping he would do something like that. Now, when you saw the Bronco, what did you observe when you saw the vehicle? When I saw the Bronco, it was parked behind a uh, post 16 near Heather's car. My daughter Holly and I pulled up one day and, and uh, there it was side by side. And I wanted that Bronco away from, I just wanted it gone. And when we went back there on the passenger window, there were two red circles and um, it looked like, a palm print was had like slid, you know, slid down, mm -hmm. circled. And so when I went into post to ask them to move, to move the Bronco away from Heather's car and to tell me what I said, that looked like maybe Heather's little hand was sliding down. They got furious because we had gone back there. They, they said, you're not allowed to go back there. They still didn't answer our questions, you know, but for me to know, that they knew on day four that Marty wasn't the man. I'm telling you, it has just turned everything upside down because all these memories I have of all the years going there with bringing them evidence in hopes that they would see Marty wasn't Marty. Marty wasn't the one who, who did this. And to, when I heard that Bill Polk told them on day four and they didn't change their strategy, it didn't make one difference. And they didn't mention one word about Heather. Well, we got to find Heather. We need to find Heather. Not one word. Heather's name never came up. Mm -mm. It's just a shame and a disgrace to everything. Now you so precious. It, it's just a shame. Now you have seen Marty Deal's wife, correct? Since all of this. I haven't seen her since the day she threatened to kill me. 
I saw, I, I've seen pictures of her recently and bless her heart. She looks terrible. She looks like she's a hundred years old. I've, I continue to send um, her sister messages and I can continue to send Eddie Kellogg, her husband, because she's, I, uh, I think she's got me blocked, I think, but Eddie Kellogg doesn't. And I, and I let him know every step of the way, you know, please just tell me what Tracy saw. Could you tell Tracy she's granted immunity? Could you tell Tracy, could you tell Tracy that I don't care if she does goes to prison. She suffered all these years carrying the burden that she's carried. I just want to know what she saw that made her scream. I've it asked, has to be something bad. I've asked the state not. police. I have begged the state police, the attorney general, the U.S. marshal. I, I send emails, which I forwarded you some of them. I have a lot of emails. And that's why I said we have. So, I mean, seriously, uh, Sarah has so much and she has official records of the investigation through the years. What steps they've taken, what steps they didn't take. Um, I'm just now. Sarah has, she has four kids. She mm -hmm. has Heather, another two girls, and a son. I now, have Heather Danielle, Holly yep. Rochelle, Haven Noel, and Nathaniel Paul Heath Jenkins Teague. Nathan Nathaniel, see my Nathaniel. son's name. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so my son's name is Nathan. So let me, so when Heather disappeared on the 26th, um, and then Marty unalived himself on September 1st. That was like four days. Yeah, that was like four days right there. Heather was living with your ex-husband at the time. Her daddy, yes. Her daddy. What the debt? I know you and I discussed it, but can you tell them what that did to her father, please? He pretty much drank until he died he he died um at an early age i forgot how old he was when he died but it was i think in the 2013 maybe i don't even know if it was it was the, i don't i don't remember what day he died it was august the first i think um oh my God. now your niece your family also experienced another tragedy on 10 years, on Heather's 10 year anniversary, August the 26th of 2005, my brother, my brother called me, um, I think it was August the 30th, maybe the 30th or something. And he said, uh, Sarah Nell, he said, Sue Ann is missing. And I said, that ain't even funny because he, you know, he's, he's kind of a jokester. And he said that um, on August the 26th, he, that Sue Ann had been missing. She, her body was found on, in uh, February. She was missing 164 days. Actually, the FBI was at my home. Mm -hmm. uh, the FBI was at my home the day that we got the call that Sue Ann's body had been found. Now, explain to everybody what this sick person said and why he chose that date. Quentin Ray was Sue Ann, Sue Ann Jenkins Ray. Um, it was her husband. He stood up in court and said that he killed Sue Ann on August the 26th to further impact our family. He was, uh, he had, Sue Ann had left him because he had dragged her down steps. He was, uh, he had abused Sue Ann. So she had left him and she had um, got a boyfriend. And when Sue Ann's body was found, there were three graves, one, one for Sue Ann one for my brother and one for the boyfriend. So you just gave me, even though you told me this, I, I've just got chills that someone can be that vicious and that evil. It's what the state that. police have done. Not just as worse, just as bad. I mean, for them to know on day four, that Marty Deal did not do this. And for me to go in to them year after, this is what I've spent my, just about my whole life, bringing them evidence that Marty Deal wasn't the man who did this. And they have laughed at me 
they literally mocked me. They have watched me come in with this poster and laughed at me. I have got a letter where they threatened to stop all communication with me if I didn't stop asking them about Marty Dill's, stop demanding that they, they admit Marty Dill was bald. It's It's been the most shameful and disgraceful thing to know that, that these these people wearing badges have the coldest hearts I have ever encountered in my life. For me to know when I found out on July the 29th that every officer, this is what amazed me, is that the first officers knew and they 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 had to have briefed every changing officer year after year after year to make sure that they deny that Marty Deal was bald. We're not going to get into the 2008 call today, are we? Where they they created. You can go ahead and talk about the 2008 call. Okay, the they have gone to such extreme lengths to protect what this eyewitness, how the eyewitness described the man with the dark bushy hair and the beard after we learned he was bald and on, on um, they called Take us time. We, time. we went to post 16 to hear the call. Well, I, I was trying to, to see if I needed to reiterate that on the 12th, uh, 12th year, we went to court to get the 911 call. Mm -hmm. We we were we were in Henderson Court. As soon as we stepped off of the elevator, and I've not told you this, this is gonna really make you mad. As soon as we got off the elevator, uh Lieutenant Scott Miller stopped us and said, Would you settle for the time and location of the call? Now this is after 12 years, and I've got a little newspaper article I'll mm -hmm. say. So after 12 years, they graciously told us the time and location of the call after 12 years, which was 115 to Indiana State Police. OK, so in 2008, when they call us in to hear the call, we just thought that, OK, this is the call he made to Indiana State Police. Right. Mm -hmm. Because that's what we had just been given a year prior. So we go in and hear the call, and it's Tim Wathall, the eyewitness, telling a female that oh, he either had dark, bushy hair and a beard, or he wore a wig and a mosquito netting. My daughter Holly literally laughed out loud. There were four officers in the room with us that day. Captain Ricky Allen, Lieutenant Pat Isbell, Sergeant Jason Kirk, and Detective Mark Carter. I when, when we I've already we've already filed a motion for these officers and Tim Walthall to be questioned. So the call that we heard in 2008 with Tim Walthall saying he wore a wig and mosquito netting has totally disappeared. I filed open records and open records appeals. The last appeal, the answer that I got from the open records appeal from the Kentucky State Police was that we do not have a copy of it. I have the paper record of the, the day of the meeting, and they even have the day of the meeting as March the 27th of 08 instead of August the 27th of 08. Uh, two weeks ago, I filed a Freedom of Information FOIA appeal because this 2008 call can't be found. It's disappeared. So, so I, go ahead. You said... He said he had a wig on. He never said that in the call that we heard, that we just listened to. That that's that's the thing. Um, when uh, this Sergeant Jason Pagan, when he called us in on February the third of two thousand sixteen, I had already voiced my concerns to him that that call had to be made up because there was no mention of a wig and mos there was never a mention of that. A so, wig or mosquito on that? No, Sar Sergeant Pagan was trying to find that call well on february the 3rd of 16 he called he called me i just happened which there is no just happened chip and i were in court with my grandson and sergeant pagan said can can you get here now so we booked to henderson post 16 
and Sergeant Pagan played this call for us, not only was there no mention of a wig and mosquito netting, but it tore me up and I had to have them stop the call because the entire description of how Heather was taken was not anything like he had told us. Plus, the, you heard the, 2000, the call that we heard. It was a male dispatcher. And he calmly, he calls Heather Caucasian. It's um, it's incomprehensible to me what they've done. So I noticed he called Heather a Caucasian, but he called the kidnapper a white man. Mm -hmm. I noticed that. So I, why I, wasn't Heather considered a white woman instead of a Caucasian? But the man was a white man. You know, Heidi, um, through the years that they can't even say Heather's name, they'll call her that missing girl or in, in, in the in the state police's files. I was so shocked and I will send you this file in, uh, after we get off here. But like I said a while ago, Tim Walthall describes Heather as, uh, oh, I've got a hot one. And I guarantee you that he's not a pervert. I guarantee you that this man is with some sort of law enforcement He's either DEA, FBI, IS, probably Indiana State Police. There's 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 some reason why he was allowed to create a call with Doug Crow in 2007, the same year we went to court to get the time and location of the call. And then we hear a call with wig and mosquito netting and, and the whole thing's disappeared. And when I send you these KSP 41, which is a list of the evidence, yes, plainly that the call was was taken. The real to real tape of the call was taken to Doug Crow in Frankfurt, who is a creative specialist. But the, the thing, another thing I don't understand is why on June the 12th of 2012, it was sent to the Department of Justice. Why does everything have to do with Heather end up either at the, the DEA, Department of Justice, Department of Justice, the FBI? Yep. You know, we'll talk about the DNA next time about Heather's bathing suit bottoms yeah. and the but me, lab and all that. Now, before then, wasn't there a female that you were speaking to and she was removed? Oh, where did she go? Oh, lost her. Hopefully she'll come back up. Um, seriously, Sarah has so much information. Uh, there was a female officer she was working with for the longest there she goes. Hold on. What happened? I don't know. You just dropped. Sarah, I was asking you about the female person, about the female officer you were working with. And then she got fired. Oh, this was the FBI lady. In the FBI lady, yes. Right. Not the officer, in 2005, yes. Uh, Samantha Deegan came in with Jerry Garner, and that was when they told us to get an attorney to sue state police post-16. After they were taken off the case, Samantha Deegan went on to be an FBI agent. So in 2008, there's a lot going on in 2008. She, I, I just had gotten a cell phone and I was sitting at a computer and she was messaging me and she was saying, answer your phone. And uh, the, the phone would ring and it would go, it would just, she she had, I would try to call her and, and the number was blocked, whatever. I said, mm -hmm. I said, unblock your phone. And she said, I can't. And then she said, Monday morning, I will be FBI Milwaukee. Call me on this number. So okay. she had something to tell me on that Friday that she wanted to tell me and, and it, we couldn't connect. So Monday morning, I called her Milwaukee FBI. She let me know that she was about to be fired, meaning that she knew that conversation that she and I were about to have would be recorded. Yep. And she told me, she said, Sarah, while Jerry and I were there, I want you to know what we learned. We learned that Heather was hired by the Democratic Party. She said, do not ask any questions. And then she said, let's put Heather's files like in five different files. Let's say she was accidentally run over. Let's say she was sold. Let's say she was fed to the hogs. Let's say she was raped and thrown into the well alive let's say um these are all the things that you had heard that she was fed to the hog she was run over and she was thrown in the well but they refused to search the property at marty deals um, i drew up my own search warrant 
I drew up yeah, my own yeah. search warrant, and Judge Hunter Whitesell from Hickman, Kentucky, was appointed. And he sat there at, at the table with Steve Gold, the, co the uh, Commonwealth Attorney. He was the, the Commonwealth Attorney at the time, I guess, or some attorney. And he had a tear in his eye. And he looked at I the read state, that statement. He looked at the state police and he said, why won't the state police search that property? And he looked at me and he said, Miss Tig, I can't grant you this. He said it would be set in precedence. And then Mark Carter, Detective Mark Carter, had said, well, I didn't know she was going to be here. And Talking Judge, about you. Judge White so looked at yeah. him and said, you can go out. The door you came same in. Same door you came in. So yeah. uh, we have Judge Philip Shepard, who knows without a doubt that the state police stood in front of him, committed perjury. We have Judge Hunter Weitzel that just could not believe he had never, ever had a mother to write up her own search warrant. But you know what? Allison Goodman in 2003 and our next uh, conversation, we need to talk about the lead that Heather, somebody was using Heather social. We'll talk about all that. Yeah. But um, Allison Goodman came to me in 2003, and, and this, this year is very, very important. She said, God told me, gave me these words, when this is all said and done, it will be a wonder to all mankind. And people will be saying, that mother, that mother, you stand and declare to God be the glory. Amen. Um, Jody B., is asking a question and I know you're um, um and I, I don't want to keep you anymore but no, okay. can we just Jody B wants to know why was this covered up I believe with all my heart Jody that Tim Walthall the eyewitness is with some sort of law enforcement uh and I have I have more than one reason to believe this I believe that Heather knew she was being watched I believe that a drug bust was about to go down her boyfriend was supposed to have met her at noon, and I believe Heather disappeared on their watch. And that would explain why they panicked, why they waited four days to do a sketch, and why <laughs> this whole investigation revolves around this eyewitness and his description of the man who took Heather mm -hmm. and the call that he created to confirm and to maintain that Marty Deal did this. And as of July the 29th, we know that they knew on day four that Marty Deal was not the man that took Heather. And the way they went to that home. And that's what I don't understand. I, I'm Bill Poe's words are still ringing in my ear. If you do it at night with the bells and the whistles, you won't get him out there alive. That was their whole plan. He, he even told them that he didn't know a family member that could go in and talk to him. That's why he wanted to go in. And he wanted to ask him about Heather. Yep. And he did say that if you do get him out, I want to be one of the first ones to talk to him. Meaning he has representation right now. So don't ask him anything. I want to be the first one to talk to him. Right. That's what he was saying. Oh, my God. There is um, there's so much more that we're going to talk about next Sunday. You want to do it around the same time or a little earlier? You can do it whenever you want. I, I appreciate you doing this so much. You have. Oh, my God. No, this case and just going through everything you sent to me. And that way I can put it, um, you, you know, and we can um, make sure we have the timeline straight with all the different evidence that you have. And let just so you know, Sarah had to declare her daughter. And I said it at the beginning. She had to declare Heather legally deceased in order for her to get access to all of these files. But just also, the FBI files. Just the FBI files. So she's not sure if her being declared deceased uh, is state, you know, so I'm going to look that up and I, yeah, I'm going to look that up. But to get the federal files, she had to uh, legally de declare her daughter deceased. Also now, in, now they're on public they're, they're public record now on the vault, but uh there's 
we got 300 we got 390 files there's only 340 on the the uh the vault which is public record now Mm -hmm. but um there's there's so many of them that have uh uh, you'll probably notice on that one it has like b6 b7 b7 yes i did i i the the that's the reasons for the redactions and most okay. are it would uh well a lot of the, the the other file that i had that had some redactions i kind of figured out what it was by just the conversations that you and i had have right. had and i i figured out i'm like oh okay so all that redacting to pull people's names out and i'm like okay this is the scenario she was talking about right. but back in february of 2024 an anonymous donor put up $10,000 for information leading to the return of Heather. So it's $10,000 and this, and that's why Sarah is saying that things are going to happen this year for sure. Well, yes. And I need to ask right now and again next week too, our family needs a civil rights attorney. We yeah. A, a year we have a year from discovery which was july the 29th i'll do it myself if i have to and you know if, if i have to I, I will but i would i've contacted three uh, so you need a civil attorney before civil july 29th it needs to be filed before july the 29th yes and the attorney general uh i've messaged him to let him know that the previous attorney general is well aware and so is he of this struggle the desperation everything all of these open records i keep filing and appeals and appeals he's aware that the state police has committed perjury and they've obstructed justice and now he's blocked my emails oh the- yeah i think yeah i wanted to yeah i wanted to bring that up the state <laughs> attorney general has blocked sarah's email address she cannot send him any emails. Mm-mm. That Listen. smells really bad. And the Black Widow is right. She says to the police, this is a case. This is a cover-up. To this woman, it's her child. And then here's the thing. It is an election year now. So they're more apt to be moved. How, um, who's running for office in your, um, in your county right now? Well, we've, we've just got a new, I mean, the, the administration has just changed in December. Uh, there, there's new administration already, already happened in the, the attorney general's office anyway. There's a new attorney general as of, uh, even the Department of Criminal Investigations, they changed administration, uh, you know, January 1st. So now you do have a GoFundMe for Heather's oh, scholarship, yes, right? Scholarship, yes. If you could put that up there, that would. Yeah, uh, hold on this, a second. Let, this let me is get the it. 15th year for Heather's scholarship. And what Heather's scholarship does, it's not like any other scholarship. It's for the graduating uh, senior at the high school where Heather graduated. She was cheerleader, class president, junior miss, runner up, first runner up. Um, what I ask is that the students write me an essay and I ask them to tell me their hopes, their dreams, their struggles, and who influenced them the most in their life. That's all the scholarship goes. That's all it's based on. And um, I used to be able to go to the school where she graduated from on her birthday, April the 25th. And I would always go in at at nine o'clock that morning because she was born at 851. So I would be at the school at nine o'clock the same eight, the same time that she was born to interview the uh, the applicants and uh, Heather's scholarship it gives money to the students to use any way they want to they do not have to be going to college they can be setting up their you know taking a mm-hmm. 
whatever. And uh, I learned early on that some of the students didn't even have a laptop. So Heather's scholarship is uh, usually I'm able to give uh, two or three laptops and money to uh, students. And yes, this, like this amount right here is over. I don't know how to, to switch it year after year. So mm -hmm. this is over like a seven or eight year period. Um, I, I, I don't leave it up running every all year long. I should, I guess. Um, I usually start, you know, in March and, and just, uh, just do it that way. Okay. So it definitely, and uh, the fact is that the donation is protected and she does say, like she just told you, Heather graduated from Webster High School in 1990. She was abducted August 26, 1995. We still do not have answers as to where she is. What really happened that day is also questionable. Every year on Heather's birthday, April 25th, our family chooses a student from Webster County High School graduating class to receive the Heather Danielle Teague Scholarship. Each applicant is asked to write an essay on their hopes, their dreams, goals, and their struggles. We stand on Matthew 10, 26. We hope you will help us to honor our Heather again this year. We are still believing in a miracle and are our Heather to come home. Pray for our Heather to come home. You know, Heidi, I, I keep telling the state police, um, all I want is Heather back. You know, I, I know y'all have done some really bad things and I don't know how, I don't know how they're going to recover from it. I, I don't see any, any recovery now. Uh, the Lieutenant that is, uh, has been in charge of me, um, for the last little over a year, I've still not even heard his voice. Still not even heard his voice. We have a lead where Heather's remains are. And I send him messages about that to help with the search, to help me, you know, not one word, not a phone call, not an email. And this this lead involves the brother-in-law, Mike Shelton, and that Heather was run over. I, I get nothing. And that's what I told the attorney general, you know, it, Shouldn't I have a, a point of contact at state police? I should. It, it's just a shame and disgrace what they've done. But you know what? When you talked to me, we talked. You said this year things are going to happen. And I do believe that you are oh, right. It's, it's, it, it is so close that, that I, I, I mean, I, I just feel it in every fiber of my being. Because I wrote to the eyewitness the other day. And I just, I told him what I'd found out that, you know, he had been a part in creating a call and I've got proof in the KSP 41s that the real to real was taken to Doug Crow. I mean, for them to go to that length, that great length of creating a call for us, it, it's just incomprehensible to me what they've done. Yeah. So she is beautiful. Heather is very, very pretty. And she showed me, Sarah, before we go, can you get the picture frame with you and Heather okay. with the side by side of your graduate with Heather's graduation and your graduation? Okay. Okay. Right. Okay. Come closer. Okay. Okay. Hold it up just like that and move it over. Okay. Right there, right there. There's a picture of Sarah when she graduated. And there's a picture of Heather. They look like twins. Beautiful. I always Beautiful. say that I was born the day that Heather was born because she's, I was just born the day she was born. And your daughters and your son they're standing by you and, you know, and they're giving you the support that you need, right? Yes. Okay. Now, just to know, too, that Sarah had, oh, my God, was it a heart attack or a stroke? Three years ago, June the 1st, I had a heart attack and I have a pacemaker. And, uh, of course, I, I take care of myself. I eat right. And uh, the doctor concluded that 
it was broken heart syndrome. And you're taking care of yourself. And oh, yeah. yeah. Well, so. I know that God has a day set aside when, when all this will be over. I, I actually moved to Manchester five years ago to write our story. And now I know why I didn't because now so much has happened, you know, and I do plan to write our story. Um, I just want Heather back. I, I just want Heather back. And and I, w I want the Kentucky State Police Post 16 to be held accountable. I want every officer that has laughed at me and absolutely lied to me, denied every ev denied every statement, every picture, every jail record, proving that Marty Deal was bald when they knew on day four yep. that Marty Deal was not the man. I want them to look me in the eye. And the fact that they offered you five, yes, people, they offered her $5 million as a settlement, but she had to sign a piece of paper stating that she would not discuss the Kentucky State Police anymore. Well, that, 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 was, that was if the lawsuit was filed. Correct. Yeah. Like, they yes. said all, all that had to happen was for chip adams to file the lawsuit and the judge would immediately issue a, a gag order and settle with us the only stipulation would be i wouldn't be able to talk about the state police but chip had just graduated law school he didn't he could not file the lawsuit and now he is our family attorney but he just let me know about 10 minutes ago that that he definitely could not file the civil suit so I need an attorney. Yep, and that was right before we went live. Right, he, right. Yep. Yeah. And so, yeah, he can't do it. She needs to have. It, uh, if he can't, I, I mean, I believe you God needs to have a civil attorney. Yeah. Yeah. I've contacted three different ones, so I expect to hear from one of them this week. But mm -hmm. now that it's out here, maybe God's going to okay. send, send one to help me. Okay. Yes, he's going to send one to help you. And uh, so I I go out tomorrow morning. I should get a break sometime Wednesday evening or uh, Thursday mid-afternoon. I can give you a call and check in with you and see exactly what's going on. Uh, wait a minute. Denver is asking, do you think someone in the PD could possibly be re related to the perp perpetrator? And that is why you would play a fake call, which that's. There's three degrees in separation of all these people. They're all related. I'm sorry. Well, I've I've tried to make a connection with, of course, you know, I, I believe Tim Walthall is with some some sort of he's either with DEA or FBI. He 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 is not a regular citizen. Uh, otherwise, when he picked Chris Bilo from a lineup in 2004, Chris Bilo would have would have been brought in and and done nothing's been done. Everything's been done to protect what the eyewitness says he saw the day Heather was taken down to the creation of a call. But the one, th the, the main thing too, they manipulated that sketch that ended up in Marty Dill's death. They manipulated. A they took it from his driver's license when that man had no hair. He didn't. Um, right. Also, um, when, Denver, I don't know if you how long you've been here, but I played a recording when Bill Poe, the attorney, went to to speak to KSP about how to get Marty Deal out of the house. And everything he said or asked them not to do is exactly what they did, which led to that man taking his life. Well, we don't know that he took it. Well, that's true. Allegedly, he right. unalived himself. There, there but were, we don't know that because someone else was in yeah. there with them. Ernie Green, who is in all these redacted documents from the FBI stuff. And there were two shots heard. I, I'll send you yep, that two call. shots heard. There were two shots, an argument. And the FBI files state plainly that the bullet retrieved from Dill's skull cannot be proven to be the one that came from that gun. Yep. So she has all of this, all of it. Uh, she has the autopsy report for Marty Deal. His head was not blown off. 
Uh, you know, there was no exit, the back of his head, I'm sorry. There was no exit wound, no nothing. I have all the work done. I have, um, all I need is an attorney to stand up with me and file this civil suit. That That's, that's all I need. Absolutely, Denver. Absolutely. That's exactly what I was telling Heidi earlier. There are answers. There's a document, which we didn't go through that, that, that the state police are keeping a secret. The FBI file, Heidi, that says if the state police are keeping a secret as. Yep, it says keeping a secret. Yep. As to the people who murdered Heather, which is more than one. And I have faxed this document to the attorney general, to the U.S. attorney, to the state police, to the FBI, begging them, tell me who there are answers. And I keep. Yep, it somebody. says keeping secrets, and then there's one that says police corruption. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> it sounds like a made up story, doesn't it? But it's not. <laughs> Look, no. it is not. It says the KSB keeping secrets. Yeah, it's so I've, I've got the FBI file, and I, I, I've tried to get answers at this point, knowing that Tracy Deal was granted immunity, knowing that Tracy was the one screaming. Knowing that Marty Deal, they knew Marty Deal wasn't the man who did this on day four. I'm 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 ready. All all an attorney has to do is stand up with me. I've I've got it. She's got everything she needs. So let's see about finding you a civil attorney that has to be in Kentucky. So let's start looking for that and doing some interviews and stuff. With well, it's, that. Finding, it's finding somebody who's brave enough to stand up against the state police. You know, I've I've been told that this is going to be one of the largest political cover-ups in the tri-state history, if not history. I mean, I, I, all I want is Heather back. They can go on with their life. They can do what they want to do. They'll answer to God someday. I just want Heather back. You want to know what happened to your daughter? Where's your daughter? Hi, 5.56 Media. How are you? Um, Now... We're talking about a case with police corruption, um, <laughs> alleged police corruption, 5.56 media. Uh, this is bad. This is Sarah Teague. Her daughter, Heather, has been missing for almost 25 years. April 25th. Almost 29 her, years. Huh? Almost, almost 29. Yeah, almost 29 years. April 25th is going to be her birthday. How old would will Heather be on April 25th? Heather will be 52. I turned 72 January the 19th. Girl, you look, I'm serious. You look great. <laughs> 72? 72. Oh my God. Yeah. Heather, look at Heather, you. Heather will be 52 this April. And I, I, you know, we've got this lead where she's, her remains are. And I, I, I can't even you know, get in touch with the landowners. And I, I keep trying and trying. And I said, wouldn't it be just like God to bring Heather home on her birthday? On her birthday. On her birthday, the same day he gave her to us. Wouldn't that be a wonder to all mankind? Like Alice okay. said. Hold on. 5.56 Media wants to know who's in charge of the case. It's Kansas, Kentucky State Police. Oh, 16 Who Henderson. Oh, 16. Uh, that there's a who's in charge of of me? No, they, of Heather's case. Well, yeah, I know, but but that, that's what they do. That they they put they put a different sergeant. I, I'm only allowed to to speak to one, but I've Lieutenant Aaron T. Pryor is on Heather's case now. He's been there over a year, and I've yet to hear his voice. Lieutenant Aaron T. Pryor. Me. Aaron, A A R O N T. Yeah, I, 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 well, right. I saw an email that you sent to him. Right. He, yeah. he won't even email me back about anything. And I know it's their way of pleading the fifth because they've already incriminated themselves. They've created their own case against themselves. I've got their, I've got their own files. They can't deny this. <laughs> Well, thank you. I'm you, you look <laughs> great. Also, the state attorney general has blocked her email. She can't email them anymore. But get this. She was told to take her case to the Department of Criminal Justice. No. The Department yeah. of Criminal Investigations in Frankfurt. Department of Criminal Investigations. And also, when I got the FBI files back, 
and there were those five files that I was concerned about. You know, Heather's last known whereabouts, the public corruption, the WP program, Agent Paul Pape in Owensboro, FBI. He said, Miss Tig, you need to take your concerns to the office of the Inspector General in Washington, D.C. I sent Heather's files there. Agent Mike McDonald let me know. He said, Miss Tig, he said, Heather's files have gone everywhere. He said they went to the DOJ, then they went to uh, FBI investigations, then they went to FBI, another branch of the FBI. He said they need to go to the Public Corruption Criminal Activity Division. That's what the that's what the Office of the Inspector General told me. There's something wrong here. Now, in the FBI files, it states, I have a copy of it, they said that certain public officials in Henderson strongly enforced methamphetamine violations in an effort to promote and protect their own coquina business. This is in an FBI file. FBI file. That was dated 12-14-2005. Heather confronted a judge, according to a file, about underage girls and prostitution. My Heather was brave. Oh, I've already, I've already contacted the governor. Uh, that's how I got the petition done to send Heather's bathing suit bottoms in after 27 years. After the 27 years, they finally sent her bathing suit bottoms and for DNA testing, we're going to get into that next Sunday. But she is working diligently to get this done and to be laughed at by police officers when she goes into post 16. That there was one captain, Heidi, there was one captain I went in and uh, I was showing him the jail records and he said, Oh, they meant brown. I said, No, they're say bald, they B A L D. And I've got other proof that Marty did was bald. And uh, I, I had just started filing open records back then. And, and he, he was so mad. He almost spit. And he said, you can file all the open records you want. He said, you won't get anything. But I did. And a police officer told you this. A detective. A captain. A captain, a captain told police. you this. Captain Robert Schultz was his name. Yeah, we're going to share this all over. We will be sharing this all over. This needs to come to light again. And there's more. There's more. So, so Denver wants to know, have you contacted anybody in the media about corruption? They all know about it. There's been newspaper articles written. The attorney general knows. I mean, this has been going on for a good 20 years that they know yes i have got one investigative reporter john webb who is he is he is helping he wrote two really good articles about the the calls and about um records being hidden okay uh sarah what government being you talking about the state police the state police yes if you can just run through that again for them because there's corruption. The FBI was involved. Now they're not involved. Go ahead, Sarah, run through that for her one more time. I need to get some more coffee. Okay. Well, the FBI came in in 2005 to tell me to get an attorney to sue the Kentucky State Police post 16 because evidence that they had taken from the vehicle filmed on the beach, the Bronco, they gave to the Kentucky State Police post 16 where it was found 10 years later, still sitting in evidence. So that was, that was one thing. And of course the, uh, the eyewitness, the call that he made was kept from us for 20 years. They manipulated a sketch that ended in the death of this, of, of Marty Deal. They used his 94 driver's license as the face for the composite sketch that wasn't done until day four. Or I don't, I don't know if, if, if she's still listening or not. I can give you my email if you want, want to email me and uh, my phone number two, Sarah with an H dot T digit five at gmail.com. 
and my phone number is 270-836-7643. Anybody's welcome to call me. That's um, information for the reward comes straight to me. The Kentucky State Police Post 16 doesn't deserve to have anything to do with Heather's homecoming. But I have contacted them about this lead that we have where her remains are, asking them to please call me or email me and help me set up a search. And I've not heard one word. So, um, Sarah's email. Yeah, I don't. Uh, so, okay, she has it. But I was going to send it to her privately. But, okay, you already gave it to her. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I want it out there because, you know, the reward, that that's where the reward's going is, is, is uh, I mean, anybody that has information about the reward can call me directly. Of course, anybody can send it. An, I've, I've begged, you know, for Tracy or anybody just to not honestly tell me where Heather is. Just just tell me where Heather is. I just want Heather back. We, we need Heather back. And we're going to uh, help you as much as we can. Um, let's um, let's talk later uh, later on this week and we'll look into uh, civil attorneys. I'll start. Matter of fact, I'll pull up a list to see in that area to see what you have. Matter of fact, I can actually um, ask my uh, I can ask my cousin if he can give me any recommendations for okay. a civil rights attorney. Well, I've contacted Ned Pillersdorf, Brandon Storm, um, Evan Taylor, and Thomas Clay. I, I've contacted those four. I, I look to hear from somebody this week. I really do. I, I look I look to hear from uh, somebody. And, and if not, I'm already prepared to file it to myself. It yourself. Yes, I know. I already have a paralegal here that, that will do it for a small fee. And uh, I'll, I'll get it done. It, it will be done. If you filed your own search warrant, uh, I know you can get this done too. And that's sad. When you told me that you have to file your own search warrant. Well, and I, I filed a lawsuit in 2013 or 2015. And of course, I didn't know what I was doing. I, 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 I didn't. And of course, I didn't know what I know now. So. Um, but you did get. So when you filed the lawsuit, you were filing for what? I just wanted. I wanted. I, I named everybody I knew of that had information about Heather. And I just wanted. Wanted Heather. I, I guess when I filed, it was uh, all I had been given was that they malice neglect. And I guess that was a criminal thing and still a civil. Mm -hmm. So I, I didn't know what I was doing. I, I just, I did it on February the 26th. That would be um, uh, the 26th, of course, is another anniversary for Heather. And it was the day after my granddaughter, Sophia Jewell was born um, and she's 11 now. So I guess that was what, 2015? Was it 15 or 13? 13. 13. Okay. Anyway, it sure has been um, a long journey. And, you know. 5.56 Media is a retired police officer. And he said he's going to research this case. Bless him. Give him my phone number and, and ask him to call me. Yeah, I can do that. Um, and I can give you her email address as well, right. but she has a lot of the files herself that she pulled through for you, which she says now it's all public information in the vault, but some pages are missing, right? Yes. And I'm, I'm actually waiting on a, a FOIA appeal over, over the 2008 call. Um, you know, the, when, when the state police played that call for us, it was in the, in the record that we were supposed to have gotten a copy of that. Uh-oh, uh -oh, he's good. asking you a question. That's a good, yeah. No, to my knowledge, they weren't. It was uh, Jerry Garner and Samantha Deegan, um, who they were the FBI agents involved in, uh, in 2005 through 2008. They were taken off the case as soon as uh, Chip and I turned in the, the recorded conversations I had made with the eyewitness. This whole investigation 
revolves around this eyewitness with the telescope. His Tim White White Tim Ball, Walthall, right? Walthall. 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 Yeah. W A L T H A A L. Yes. Yes. So 5.56 media. Mr. Smith, as he's called, is a retired police officer. All right. So she's asking, can it be an out of state of a an out of state attorney who's not worried about any consequences. I thought when you filed any kind of suit in the, in the state, you have to be able to practice in that state. Well, th they don't have to live in the state to be able to practice in the state. Yeah, but I'm saying they have to be able to practice in right. the state. I yes. would think so. Yeah. Yeah. So they would have to have a law license to practice in Kentucky as well. Right. And it just can't be any attorney. It has to be someone. Now you have some attorneys that are uh, national, especially for civil rights. You know, they can practice in, in, in any state. So that's what we really need to look for. Well, uh, the most important thing it's going to take is somebody brave enough to stand up with me against these state police because... Um, I believe Judge Philip Shepard, the Honorable Judge Philip Shepard, has been waiting for seven years for us to file a motion of uh, contempt because the state police did not give us the 2008 call that we wanted. And they stood in front of the Honorable Judge Philip Shepard and absolutely. Why? They, they stood in front of Judge Shepard and committed perjury. I mean, it, it just it. it it's just incomprehensible to me what they've done and what they've been allowed to do, how long they've been allowed to do it. And had I not opened that Tracy underscore DUI that day and, and heard Bill Polk telling me that it, it. I'm telling you again, from the FBI files, they're saying public officials in Henderson strongly enforce methamphetamine violations in an effort to promote and protect their own cocaine businesses. And Tim Walthall has businesses in South America. Yep. And he's not told the truth about anything. Yep. His, his whole story is. This but, is from the FBI files date of transcription 12 14 2005 see it hasn't made any difference that tim walthall can say all oh, the back of his head was blown away and there wasn't an exit wound this has been a process of me finding out things and bringing it to the state police and it's made no difference in the made no difference and when i heard bill polk telling them that marty didn't fit the description it didn't make any difference in how they conducted the rest of the day they surrounded him and made sure he wasn't alive. Yep. And there were two shots fired. And then there were two shots. An argument and yelling. Yeah. And um, what's this? Ernie Green was in there with Marty Deal when he unalived himself or allegedly unalived himself. Got was you. he saying correct? I don't know what he's saying. Oh, no, he was just saying correct. He was, oh. um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. He and Jody been going back and forth with conversations. Oh, okay. So, yeah. So, you know, because they have their own conversations in the chat. So, well, I, I, I've i been telling uh, even the attorney general and this this will break your heart. when When you hear our story, it will break your heart. And it will shatter your faith in the people that wear badges. Because looking back at all my journals and all my notes and recorded conversations, all the times I've brought them proof Marty was bald, to hear their own attorney tell them on day four. Yeah, 5.56 media. I don't know if you were here when I played the recording between um, Marty Deal and his wife's attorney, Bill Poe and the Kentucky State Police, this man clearly stated that Marty was in an unstable condition. They are not going to do any good by going in at night to get him with bells and whistles if they want to bring him out alive. He told them it's better to do it during the daytime. The police says that, you know, just in case 
uh, he can see them coming. They wanted to go under cover of night. They went in flashing their lights um, just to aggravate him. And they knew what they were doing. That attorney and the file that she had was mislabeled. The file is labeled. I'm going to show you. I'm not going to play it again. She just happened to stumble across the file is labeled as Tracy DUI, uh, Tracy underscore DUI underscore reviewed. That's bullshit. That they intentionally mislabeled that file. They intentionally mislabeled that audio file. And the paper record of the meeting that we had uh, in 2008 is got the wrong date on it too. And I have a dated picture with me and my attorney and Holly standing in front of Kentucky State Police Post 16. Yeah. So, so I smell corruption here. I smell cover up here. But um, this is crazy. So, Sarah, I am going to let you go. We will pick up again on Sunday. 5.56 um, Media, if I go to your channel, do you have an email address there so I can email you some stuff? So, because I have, uh, she sent me uh, some FBI documents, but if you want to just talk to Sarah directly, I can, I can send you her number. So that way you can speak to her directly. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to go to, your channel and see if you have an email address there because I, I can send it to you and that way you can either contact her. Um, so Sarah, is it okay if he contacts you directly, if you, he has any questions? You put my number and my email out there and anybody that, that wants to, to give any information, even anonymously, tell me where Heather is and we'll, we'll get the $10,000 to them somehow i don't care if anybody goes to jail i don't care if tracy deal goes to jail i don't want any it doesn't matter to me i just want the kentucky state police post 16 to be held accountable to look me in the eye i want heather's life-size portrait to be hung at post 16 i want my daughter back and i want i want this to be over i'm ready to go on with my life i'm 72 years old i've got great grand kids this is this is what i do all day every single day there's people that know what i'm struggling with and and they block me i can't get anybody to stand up with me well we're gonna stand with you that's for sure but he said he's gonna re rock he's gonna re-watch get all the info and then research more and he will research as well bless you bless you I knew this was going to be good. I was shaking so hard. You were too. I was shaking. Look, I was shaking because there's so much. And so we've only covered up to like 2008 and not all of 2008. So on Sunday, we're probably going to go a little earlier. And that way she can lay out everything else she has. I um, hope then that, that, that I find more out about this DNA because th that's... That's it took them 20 something years to send her bikini bottoms and a towel for DNA. 20 right. something years. And they sent it to Florida State. I mean, they sent it to the Florida lab on mm -hmm. December the 5th of 2022. And uh, September the 5th, which was almost a year later, they let me know that the Florida lab needed more funding. And, uh, but, but they had already started the testing. Okay, November comes, which is almost a year to the day. They, I get an email saying that uh, the FBI had contacted the, the, them, that the Florida lab would contaminate, ruin the evidence, and the FBI lab could do it cheaper. And that they had contacted the Kentucky Central Lab, which is in Frankfurt, to get this done, to get her beta suit bottoms and her towel out of the Florida lab. I contacted the Kentucky Central Lab, they have not heard from Kentucky State Police since 2007. Mm, mm. 
Mm-mm-mm. Okay. So there's Sarah's email. Um, I just dropped it in the chat. Okay. Thank you. Okay. You and please just in. when you emailing her, just remember that uh try your best to be sensitive to what she's going through. And you know, if you're gonna you want to be helpful, that's great. But just remember, this is a mother that's searching to find out what happened to her daughter. And it is almost 29 years. And on April 25th, Heather would have, she will be 52 years old. And she's been missing since she was 23. 23 years, four months. 23 years old. In my, 23 years, four months, and one day. That's how she was when this happened. Yep. So again, when Heather was 23 months old, right? She was she was 23 months old is when you had a feeling that some big man would come and take your daughter away. I wrote in, in her journal, I wrote her a little yep. journal. It says August 25th, right. 1974. <laughs> When Heather was 23 months old, I wrote in a journal to her, I am so afraid a big man will someday take my Heather away. And you know, some people uh, in my church especially say that I spoke that into existence. And I was like, you know what? That was God's preparation as much as he could. He was preparing me because he brought that journal back to me on the third week Heather was missing. It was in the bottom of a big box. Mice, nothing had bothered that journal. It was protected. So then on August 26, 1995, Heather went missing at 23 years old. <laughs> and that's some stuff. So then Heather wrote, um, so Heather wrote something. She says, besides intolerant faces, I stand holding heart and soul in hand reaching for someone to remember, to comprehend, to recognize my struggle, my desperation. Is there anything left that's pure? I know addicts of hypocrisy, mockery, the drug of choice. Petty spent discriminately is still prejudice. Call out to all the homeless people. Aren't they people without a home? <laughs> that was from Heather's writing. And I'm living her writings because I stand in front of these police intolerant faces, heart and soul in hand. And that's what my book's going to be about is heart and soul because I, 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 I like that name, heart and soul. So I, that is a great name for that book, heart and soul. Okay. So we're going to go, but that's, that was a little bit of what Heather has written. Um, whether you brought it into existence or not, I do believe you're right. I think God was preparing you because it was just weird. August 25th, you wrote this in 1974. August 26, 1995, Heather was taken by a big man. <laughs> much better. There's a much bigger picture here than what anybody realizes because you, you can't tell me that there was more than one officer. I mean, I, I've had one officer at state police to stand up and play that call for us. And he was immediately taken off Heather's yeah. case and he took an early retirement. But you can't tell me that through the years, there's not been more officers that it didn't tug at their heart, that they didn't see me come in with absolutely my heart and soul at their mercy. Just do the right thing. You know, Marty Deal was bald. <laughs> And they, they, they chose to not do it. Yeah. So let's just see what happens. But um, so Black Widow Channel says, our God is an amazing God. And there is so much we can't comprehend. And she's so right. Absolutely. And on that, Sarah, is there anything you want to say before we go? You just go to Vegas and have a good time. Oh, I'm not going to Vegas now. I'm going oh. to Vegas. <laughs> not, no, not now. Not going now. Tomorrow. <laughs> no, no. Tomorrow I'm traveling. It's business. Uh, but Vegas, our plan was to Reno and somehow or another, don't ask me how, 
We always seem to end up in Vegas. There are no shows going on in Reno in June. So somehow or another, it always seems to be Vegas, but oh well. So, but again, I'm going to do some looking to for uh, for civil rights attorneys. Um, I know I'm going to be busy at least. I go in early. My flight, I'm flying east. So that's going to be a long flight. So I have time to look up stuff while I'm in the airport and everything. Cause I have like a two and a half hour layover. And then, um, so I'll, I'll have time to look up some stuff and I'll make sure that, uh, no, not have a great time for work. No, no, no. I'm not going to Vegas to June. I'm still, I still want to go to Reno though, but, uh, I'll send and then you the I argument about the uh, two shots and the argument and, uh, about okay, the, send me those the documents as well. that were found on the floor. You know, a 22 revolver doesn't. Yes, casing. yes, we meant to say that. So that was casings found on the floor, and a 22 doesn't have casings. I mean, it's like there's not one area. There's not one area that something that it just doesn't. It's just not right. I mean, every which way I turn, there's more more questions than there are answers. But I do know there are answers. And state yeah. police are not giving them to me. Well, you're going to get them. Yes, All right. right. <laughs> thank Good you night. very much, thank Mr. You. Smith. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so Sarah, much. Nice to meet you, Heidi. It, it, I'm telling you, this is every time. And then every time you send me something new, I'm reading it. And I'm like, oh, my God. So, but one thing I like about it is that you're not putting out innuendos. You have facts to back up what you're saying. You have the proof to show what really happened. So and that's exactly what I tell the everybody. That's what I tell the attorney general in every email sent. I will not make any accusations without the proof. I have the proof. I just need yeah. somebody to stand up with me. All right. So I I really really appreciate you and we would definitely definitely talk uh like midweek but anything you have that you want to send to me just send to me and um i'll go through it but i know i'm gonna have time to read through some more stuff while i'm in the airport and while i'm flying so i will have uh two phones a laptop and a tablet so okay. whatever you <laughs> <laughs> and you did put Heather's scholarship up there, right? Yes, I did. I put the link and everything in the chat. I've not had a lot of time to work on her scholarship this year. Um, we have 20 something applicants and I go, you know, I'll make sure they send me a picture so I can, you know, see, see who's writing to me. But I've okay. been working so hard on um, trying to find who owns this property and contact the Ohio Valley search and rescue team to get this search done before they stop start planting crops. Okay, email me the address and, and let me look through the property records uh, if you haven't had time to do it yet. Oh, because they have to be the I, I can give you the address. I've, I know who owns it. It's Cypress Creek Land Company out of uh, St. Louis, Missouri. P it's a Peabody subsidiary and mm -hmm. uh, they're a big conglomerate now, an electric company. And I, I, I have left messages with every prompt and I can't get anybody to call me back. The property is at 7871 <clears throat> Green Lick Road, Cordon, Kentucky. Green Lake? Green Lick, L-I-C-K. Kentucky. Uh -huh. And the home that was there, who the, the man was friends of Mike Shelton and Eddie Kellogg and these other people, uh, his home blew away in the tornado. And, there you go. Uh, she deals in mortgages and she deals a lot with companies. <laughs> all right. See, I knew this was going to be the best podcast. <laughs> so Christy is, is at 7871 Green Lick Road. Cordon. Cordon, Kentucky. Cordon, Kentucky. Okay. See, 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 see. I know. I knew this was going to be a good one. <laughs> Let's see what we come up with. And uh and uh Christy, I will uh I will definitely send you uh well it's in the chat too, but if you have any questions for 
Christy, I, I, I can make sure that you're able to contact her in case you need anything during the week. I'm not, um, cause I'm going to be in and out. So, and I don't know how much I'm going to be able to answer my phone or not. So we'll see. Okay. So again, I love you guys. And Black Widow says that's near Evansville. Yep, it is. Henderson is right across the bridge from Evansville. There's hardly anybody in Evansville that hasn't heard about Heather Teague. You used to have billboards up there. I, we had a really good billboard one year as you going from Henderson into Evansville. Now, she did say she was going to be in Kentucky. I think she said June. She's going to be in Kentucky. Uh, the Black Widow, I think she said she'll be there in June. Yeah, I think she said she'll be there in June. Yep, yeah. June. See, I remember reading that. Is the Black Widow, is, is that a podcast? Yes, yes, yes. She has a channel. And then Heath Wheeler says, yes, that's where I'm at. So you're in Evansville? Oh, damn. Did that? They've heard about Heather. She says she'll be there June 13th. I'll be in uh, Dixon. I'll, I'll go back to uh, Webster County, May the 9th, for the awards ceremony. And See, then my daughter Haven's birthday is May the 8th, so I'll, I'll be in town. Okay, we days. will be spreading the word. Heath Wheeler, yes, he, he is there. He lives there. Oh, my God. We're going to definitely get the word out for you, and um, we're going to keep push, 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 pushing until something happens. Yes. Heather is oh, coming. wait a minute. He said, uh, I'm, I'm April. I was at Heather's one year anniversary. Hi, April. April. What's your last name? They're not going to put their last name okay. in the chat. I bet I know who it is. Oh my God. What yes, a small world. Oh, I was fixing to say that small world. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Heath. <laughs> You were at Heather's one year anniversary. Oh my God. Have you watched any of the, the news uh, the uh, on Heather's anniversaries? Heidi, have you had time to watch some of those? No, not yet. And uh, he says, you do know them and I'll get a hold of you. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Okay, you do know them and they'll get a hold of you. All right. You got people that's going to stand with you, woman, and push, push, push. You know, it, if it wasn't for the prayers and uh, people that really do care, even if it's a handful, that, that's all that matters. That's yeah. That's all that matters. Except and that I can't wait. wait. Now, I can't wait for 5.6, 5.56, Mr. Smith. Um, and I wasn't going to say anything until he said, but yes, he is a retired New York NYC police officer. All right. Retired. And Bernice Andrews said, they stand with you, sweetie. <laughs> They're all standing with you. Okay. And it's just um, the strength that you've shown. I've and never had a podcast like this before. I've never. You haven't. Ever. Okay. <laughs> this is the first time that there's ever been any interaction or, uh, yeah, this is wonderful. So I'm, <laughs> it's all about perfect timing. I'm telling you. And you, and you know, and cause I was telling you that you didn't have to come on camera. You, you were like, no, I want to be there. I'm like, okay. But, uh, yeah. So you it uh, so long. I, I had my grandson all day and his mother just picked him up. I didn't even have time to wash my hair. Because we talked <laughs> for a couple hours. So I was like, well, I really shouldn't go on live with me looking like this. But th that that's not the point. The point is, it has to be personal because it just is. You know, that's my firstborn daughter. Yeah, I'm telling you, at 72 and everything that you've gone through, the stress, everything, Sarah, you look gorgeous, your strength, <laughs> your, I mean, just the strength that you have to do this daily to find out. And God is driving you. Oh my and goodness. yeah, I'm telling you, you're being driven and you're going to get the answers that you need that I do. They believe are close. We are close. Yes, we are. Yeah. So, um, I am, um, uh, miss me, miss not 
me sorry. So please tell, oh, please tell Miss Sarah. Well, well, yes, I knew what you meant, Bernice. Please tell Miss T, we will pray as well. God bless you both. Thank I you knew so what you much. meant, sweetie. Yeah. So Sarah, I will talk to you later, guys. Thank you, thank you all for being here. Let's pray. Let's spread the word. Let's get this out. Let's see what we can do here. And let's push this forward. And that's one thing I can say is she has the evidence. She has to prove on everything that she has said and she can back it up. And I've the, the record. Work. I've got the work done. I've got it all. I mean, I've got it. I've got a packet. I'm fixing to send to Judge Shepard. And I just, uh, I, I've, I've got it. I just need somebody to stand up with me. And if God yeah, wants and right now me, you're sitting in Sarah's room, right? Heather's room, yeah. Heather's room. I said Sarah's room. Heather's room. Yes, let's see. There's. I like the, oh my goodness. And let me show you this poster here. Okay. Oh. You can see it in the background there. Oh. Oh. I see it. Brain, where is Heather? I saw it. Yeah. One year. Enough I, is enough. Heather's, Heather's uh, boyfriend, her first boyfriend, Mickey Blue. He, uh, he said, you know what? Enough is enough. So he and I came up with this. He, he paid for the poster and enough is enough. And that's where we are right now. Oh my God. I, I love that. The, uh, prosecuting attorney the other day. I said, I don't want to know anything else. I do not want to know anything else that they've done. And here now this DNA comes up. Okay. Well, let's see what we hear about the DNA. Okay. Thank you, sweetie, for sharing your story. We will do a part two on Sunday. We're going to try to do it a little earlier. Okay. Um, but but you have to let me know if you got the grandkids or how you. No, no, no. This, this Sunday, I have nobody. Everybody okay. my this Sunday. Will be back home and, and the other ones will be at their mom. So this okay. Sunday. That whenever you want to do it, I'm free. So I'll probably do it like one o'clock my time. It'll be four o'clock your time. Sounds good to me. Because you're Eastern and I'm um and I'm well, I'm Pacific Coast. Okay. So I can't even think anymore. But you guys have a great evening. Um, Sarah, prayers, 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 and strength for you. Bless and I would definitely talk to you during the week. Yes. And they're all standing with you. They want you to know that they're there. You have people in the chat that are going to go back and rewatch and take notes. Uh, they're going to be looking into things. So you do have, what's the name of her scholarship? Okay, let me put it there again. Hold on a second. Hold on. I put the link in the chat earlier, but I'm going to put it there again. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Let me go back and get it. Hold on a second. <laughs> uh, scholarship. Heather Scholarship. Hold on. I'm going to put the link in the chat one more time. I just put the link. I don't know where it went. No, it's not going to let you do it because you don't have yeah, yeah. a wrench. Okay, there is the scholarship. And again, let me show it to you before I get out of here. Let me show it to you. Oh, it put you put it in a private chat. That's where it went. Oh, okay. I see it. It's in a private chat. Um, there it is. It's the Heather Danielle Teague Scholarship. And she does it every year. This is the 15th year. Can the you post this year. link right here that I just posted? Yep. See, it's in the chat. If you look, you see it. It's in the chat. Oh, okay. Yep, it's in the chat. Okay. So that is her. Uh, no problem, ASOPs. That is the link right there. And this is her thing. Uh, and this is the 15th year. Yes. That she's done this. So... Uh, and then, as you see, your donations are protected, okay? Your donations. Is Christopher Hicks related to? No, I'm sorry. Uh, so it's telling you that your donations are protected. So this is the 15th year she's done this. She's been doing this since August. Uh, oh. See, and this is her little video she has. 
Yeah, that that was on the. I held a press conference on the uh, in 2015. See, this was before we heard the the call he made in 2016. Uh, the call that was played for us in 2016. Do, do they need this link to? I don't. I don't know how. No, I already put it in the chat. Okay, I already put it there. I'm just showing them. Um, well, you've done a really good job, Hadi. Oh, thank you. And that's her. So are you in the front of the courthouse or is that the jail? Oh, I'm in front of the, that. That is the old courthouse. Yeah, they're in Madisonville. Okay. And you know, purple is my favorite color. <laughs> I hang, I hang lavender ribbons for Heather and uh, Allison Goodman, the lady I told you about, who was my pastor at Victory Church mm -hmm. in Madisonville. She wrote a song, Lavender Ribbons. Yeah, I'm sure I love that color. Well, so when Heather was little, her whole room was in lavender. We had lavender wallpaper, a lavender four, you know, the four poster canopy bed. It had we had lavender carpet, lavender bedspread. So after she after this happened, a friend of hers that that remembered her lavender room, you know, she said, "Well, let's make lavender ribbons." So that's what we did. Well, thank you, and we're gonna um, and we're gonna continue, and you're gonna give us updates, and we're gonna do some more, and I can't wait to see what five point what Mr. Smith comes up with, and I'm sure he's gonna make some phone calls. You know what? A lot can happen in three days. So by the time yep. we talk next Sunday. Oh, wait a minute. I did my wedding in lavender and purple. Oh, my God. <laughs> La well, purple is the color of royalty. So lavender is right there with it. Yes. So, <laughs> And thank you guys for being here. I really appreciate it. I know it's late. Uh, cause it's six 38 for me. So it's nine 38 for a lot of you. And I know you have to go to work tomorrow. I know I have to be at the airport tomorrow morning at five 45. So whoo, I say five 45 because I hate to stay there and get there two hours or an hour and a half early when there's nobody in the TSA line. And I know no one's flying out on a Monday morning out of Washington state, out of Spokane. So I'm serious. I always arrive at the airport like 45 minutes before my flight. And that's a bad habit, but that's what I do here. If I'm flying out of Houston, I get there like an hour or so earlier because it takes forever to go through T uh, to, uh, to go through TSA. So Thank you, Sarah. I will talk at you later, guys. Good night. Thank Have a so great much. night. Sarah, do you know how to get out? Just exit out. Exit okay. out. That's all you do. Oh, there she goes. Guys, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so, so much. I really appreciate it. And I'm going to um, talk to you guys later. I do not know, but Thursday. I told Debbie I was going to let her know. I'll let you know. I'll see what, because I'm leaving Friday, but I don't know what's the plan for Thursday. So if I don't see you Thursday, I will definitely be seeing you Saturday. So have a great, great, great evening and have a wonderful week. Thank you guys for being here. Bye.